shop. Really? At the time, they were. Good morning, everyone. If everyone could please start making your way to your seat. We will be starting very shortly. I would like to start off by saying good morning to everyone. My name is Maria Ellis. I am the Executive Secretary for the MedCAC. Should you have any questions or concerns, please feel free to grab me, but not so aggressively, please. <laughs> um, just as you can see, we do have a packed house, and it will get even more packed. So when speaking, could you please keep your, your tone to a minimum as we are broadcasting live via the webcast and we do have a court reporter. And again, as you see, we are fairly tight. So um, if you did not sign in at the table outside of the auditorium, I would greatly appreciate it if you do so. Also. If you are going to be a speaker, if you would like to be a non-scheduled speaker, please make sure you sign up outside. Again, I will announce this again. Does anyone have any questions for me? And I will come to you individually. Also, the guard said someone left their room key from the Marriott. I don't know if you need it, if you're going back, but I do have it just in case you're staying another night. So just know that I do have your room key, okay? Does anybody have, if you have any questions for me, just throw your hand up and I'll walk to you real quickly because we should be getting, the panel should be coming over shortly. No questions? Concerns? Complaints? Yes, all right.
Yeah, it's short, folks. You can't even see it. Hey, good, good. The microphones are on. No whispering. We're a little bit too green if we can't plug in our computers. Good morning and welcome, Vice Chairperson, members, and guests. I am Maria Ellis, the Executive Secretary for the Medicare Evidence Development and Coverage Advisory Committee, MedCAT. The committee is here today to discuss lower extremity peripheral artery disease. The following announcement addresses conflict of interest issues associated with this meeting and is made part of the record. The conflict of interest interest statutes prohibit special government employees from participating in matters that could affect their or their employer's financial interests. Each member will be asked to disclose any financial conflicts of interest during their introduction. We ask in the interest of fairness that all persons making statements or presentations disclose if you or any member of your immediate family own stock or have another formal financial interest in any company, including an internet or e-commerce organizations that develops, manufactures, distributes, and or markets consulting, evidence reviews or analysis, or other services related to lower extremity peripheral artery disease interventions. This includes direct financial interest, consultant fees, and significant institutional support. If you have not already received a disclosure statement, they are available on the table outside of the auditorium. We ask that all presenters please adhere to their time limits. 
We have numerous presenters to hear from today and a very tight agenda, and therefore cannot allow extra time. There is a timer at the podium that you should follow. The light will begin flashing when there are two minutes remaining and then turn red when your time is up. Please note that there is a chair for the next speaker and please proceed to that chair when it is your turn. We ask that all speakers addressing the panel, please speak directly into the mic and state your name. For the record, voting members present for today's meeting are Dr. Doug campos Outcult, Dr. John Jeffrey Carr, Dr. Aloysius Kujat, Dr. Richard Deo, Dr. Peter Lawrence, Dr. Frank Lefebvre, Dr. Sandra Lewis, Dr. Marcel Salive, Dr. Julie Swain, and Dr. Diana Zuckerman. A quorum is present and no one has been recused because of conflicts of interest. The entire panel, including non-members, will put non-voting members will participate in the voting. The voting results will be available on our website following the meeting. I ask that all panel members please speak directly into the mics. This meeting is being webcast via CMS in addition to the transcriptionist. By your attendance, you are given consent to the use and distribution of your name, likeliness, and voice during the meeting. You are also given consent to the use and distribution of any personally identifiable information that you or others may disclose about you during today's meeting. Please do not disclose personal health information. In the spirit of the Federal Advisory Committee Act and the Government in the Sunshine Act, we ask that the advisory committee members take heed that their conversations about the topic at hand take place in the open forum of the meeting. We are aware that members of the audience, including the media, are anxious to speak with the panel about these proceedings. However, CMS and the committee will refrain from discussing the details of this meeting, of this meeting with the media until its conclusion. Also, the committee is reminded to please refrain, refrain from discussing the meeting topics during breaks or at lunch. If you require a taxi cab, there are telephone numbers to local cab companies at the desk outside of the auditorium. Please remember to discard your trash in the trash cans located outside of this room. And lastly, all CMS guests attending today's MedCAC meeting are only permitted in the following areas of CMS single site the main lobby, the auditorium, the lower level lobby, and the cafeteria. Any persons found in any area other than those mentioned will be asked to leave the conference and will not be allowed back on CMS property again. And now I would like to turn the meeting over to Tamara Sirk Jensen. Thank you, Maria. So I just, I know we're running a little bit late, so I'll keep my remarks very, very brief. And I wanted to uh, thank everybody for attending. This is a very important topic for the Medicare program and the coverage and analysis group. And the reason for this meeting is really to see the state of the evidence today. And then based on what we hear today, I think the coverage and analysis group will go back and will take a look at it and make decisions on what we will do next policy-wise. So, so really the focus of this is about the evidence that is key for us. So that is really what we want to focus on and that is what we want to hear about because those, the, the basis of that evidence is what we will decide on and what our next steps might be. And currently, just to remind everybody, we do not have a national coverage determination open on this particular topic. I think that is why we are looking at this today to determine whether we do want to open up an NCD or do something else in the future. So again, thank you for everyone for coming today. It is a very crowded room, so I know everyone feels like they're a little bit on top of each other. Uh, but I think it will be a very good, me very good meeting. And again, thank you for the panel for traveling here as well. And then Dr. Peter Bach. Yes, I also, we are running a bit behind. I am the timekeeper here, as well as the person who's going to try and keep the discussion focused. Uh, thank you all for coming. This is an important public process to uh, you know, move the discussion around the evidence for uh, these interventions forward. Thank you to the panelists all for coming. Uh, and I think we should probably get started. Do you want me to introduce? The panel should introduce themselves okay. and disclose. 
Okay. Jamie, before you start, I'm going to have the panel introduce themselves. I'm Peter Bach. I'm a physician, pulmonary and critical care doc at uh, Sloan Kettering. I'm the vice chair of this body, but I'm acting as chair today. Yeah, I'm Doug campus Alcult. I'm with Mercy Care Plan, which is a state Medicaid uh, health plan in Arizona. I'm uh, John Jeffrey Carr at Vanderbilt University in the Department of Radiology, Cardiovascular Medicine, and Biomedical Informatics. I have no significant disclosures, although my retirement account has numerous stocks that could be internet companies or something. <laughs> but it's not significant. Thank you. And I ask all the panelists to disclose. Yeah, I have no, nothing to disclose. I, I don't either. I'm Al Sujay, um, cardiologist and intensivist, uh, professor of clinical medicine at SUNY at Stony Brook School of Medicine and medical director for healthcare partners and IPA, and I have no disclosures. I'm Richard Dio. I'm a general internist working in the Department of Family Medicine at Oregon Health and Science University. Uh, I have no disclosures. I'm Peter Lawrence. Uh, I'm the Chief of Vascular Surgery at UCLA and direct a uh, Gonda, the Gonda Vascular Center, which is an interdisciplinary vascular center, uh, and I have no disclosures. I'm Frank Lefebvre. I'm an internist and medical director for Blue Cross Blue Shield Association in Chicago. Um, and uh, besides being paid by Blue Cross, I have no other um, disclosures. I'm Sandra Lewis. I am a cardiologist from Portland, Oregon. I have a clinical appointment at Oregon Health and Sciences University and practice at Northwest Cardiovascular Institute. I have no disclosures. I'm Marcel Salib, a physician from the National Institute on Aging, which is part of NIH and the federal government, and I'm here representing myself. I have no disclosures. Uh, Julie Swain, cardiovascular surgeon and, uh, and director of Center of Medical Devices, uh, Mount Sinai School of Medicine, New York, no conflicts. I'm Diana Zuckerman, president of the National Center for Health Research. Our center does not accept funding from pharmaceutical or device companies, but I personally have stock in Johnson & Johnson. <clears throat> Bob uh, Cormos, I'm a cardiothoracic surgeon at the University of Pittsburgh Heart and Vascular Institute. I'm the Brack Hatler Chair of Cardiothoracic Transplantation uh, at the University of Pittsburgh. I have no disclosures. I'm Ted Listig, Director of Corporate Biostatistics at Medtronic. I'm the Indian, uh, industry representative, and I'm an employee and shareholder and hold options in Medtronic. Good morning. I'm Alan Hirsch. I'm a vascular medicine specialist and vascular clinical trialist at the University of Minnesota. I work in our School of Public Health in cardiovascular epidemiology and health service research. There are five relevant disclosures uh, to our university for research from AstraZeneca, Merck, Bayer, Pluristem, and um, uh, Tactile Medical. Uh, first, introduce Jamie Hermanson from CMS, who's going to go over the uh, topic and the voting questions. Hello, my, my name is Jamie Hermanson, and welcome to today's meeting of the Medicare Evidence Development and Coverage Advisory Committee. I'm a health insurance specialist here with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. The purpose for, of today's meeting is to review the evidence um, of existing interventions related to lower extremity peripheral artery disease and address areas where evidence gaps may exist. The clinical outcomes of interest to the Medicare program include reduction in pain, avoidance of amputation, improvement in quality of life and functional capacity, including walking distance, wound healing, avoidance, in, avoidance of cardiovascular events such as myocardial infarction, stroke, cardiovascular death and all-cause mortality, and avoidance of harms from interventions. The MedCAC panels do not make coverage determinations, but CMS often benefits from their advice. By voting on specific questions and their discussions, MedCAC panel members advise CMS about how they may wish to use the existing evidence in the future. These voting questions include terms like asymptomatic, intermittent claudication, and critical limb ischemia, and these terms will be further explained in subsequent pre presentations. For question one, for adults with asymptomatic lower extremity PAD, how confident are you that there's sufficient evidence of an intervention that improves immediate near-term health outcomes or long-term health outcomes? Discussion topics 
um, for this question include if intermediate confidence, meaning a, an average score of greater than or equal to 2.5, please identify the specific interventions and associated outcomes. Considering the heterogeneity of the Medicare population, please discuss which subgroups the evidence shows are likely to or likely to or not or likely not to benefit from the intervention. For question two, for adults with lower extremity intermittent claudication, how confident are you that there's sufficient evidence for an, evi for an intervention that improves inter immediate near-term health outcomes or long-term health outcomes? And the discussion questions are the same as those for question one. For question three, for adults with lower extremity critical limb ischemia, how confident are you that there, there is sufficient evidence for an intervention that improves immediate near-term health outcomes or long-term health outcomes? And again, the discussion questions are the same as those for question one. We're also asking the MedCAC panel to discuss the important evidence gaps um, that may not have been previously or sufficiently addressed. And finally, to discuss any apparent, tr apparent treatment disparities and how they may affect the health outcomes of Medicare beneficiaries. I thank you for your attention, and I'll now turn the meeting back over to Dr. Bach. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm now going to ask uh, Skylar Jones, uh, Dr. Skylar Jones and Dr. Manesh Patel uh, from Duke to come and present the uh, technical assessment. Technologist. Good morning. Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It's my uh, honor to present um, some of the uh, AHRQ um, evidence health uh, care program um, evidence on treatment strategies for patients with peripheral artery disease. I'm going to be speaking with Dr. Scholar Jones on behalf of Dr. Shriek Vimlapali and others on this program. These are the relevant disclosures displayed on this screen for both Dr. Jones and myself. Dr. Vimlapali, the other co authors on this document, which is PubMed searchable, and there will be some references that we'll show you throughout the conversation, um, have no conflicts or interest to disclose. Uh, of note, uh, we did use a, a technical panel and a TEP, a sort of technical panel of experts and peer reviewers, and they disclosed their relationships on the publication. I'll start with things we may all know, but we wanted to make sure we use the similar language. I will walk through the background. Dr. Jones will go through the evidence review, and then we'll give you our conclusions. So peripheral artery disease, as many of you all know, is a chronic atherosclerotic narrowing or a blockage of the arteries through the lower extremities, and its intended consequences affect patients um, for both the limb and their cardiovascular outcomes. We've already heard today something about the categories of how you might clinically think about patients with symptomatology of peripheral artery disease. There are three groups that we will be exploring and presenting. Um, asymptomatic, uh, intermittent claudication, which is defined as exercise-induced ischemic symptoms to that uh, or leg pain while walking and or weakness that is relieved by rest. We'll talk about how typical or atypical those symptoms are in a moment. And then, of course, the mortality rate from stroke and MI is increased significantly for age match controls that have intermittent claudication. And then critical limb ischemia, which you will hear a fair amount about, is pain at rest, eventually leading to a gangrene and potential amputation. There are several disease classification systems for patients with peripheral artery disease. On this slide, you see represented a few of those. There's the Fontaine stage, a Rutherford stage, and at the bottom, a cutout from a recently published um, categorization by the Society of Vascular Surgery on patients with critical limb ischemia or wounds. And across the spectrum, you can see that the staging systems give you information around patients that are asymptomatic, have claudication, or critical limb ischemia. We will present that data when possible in the evidence review. The first message, I think, in background in many of the guidelines is focusing on classical symptoms. This is the majority of patients with peripheral artery disease. This is one of many studies that shows that only a third of patients may have typical claudication with greater than 50%, they may have atypical limb symptoms, but they are functionally limited. And then 5 to 10% of the patients may have critical limb ischemia. This is the ankle brachial index data from Jerry Folks and others that shows, in fact, that this test is fairly sensitive and, when used with Framingham, is able to diagnose PAD and predict cardiovascular outcomes with, with the, the axis on the bottom showing you the patient's actual ankle brachial index and then the hazard ratio for cardiovascular events across the y-axis. And you can see as the, as the ischemic limitation increases, their cardiovascular events go up. It's also notable that there are non-compressible vessels on the right side of the slide where patients' risk goes up again. 
This is taken from Dr. Hirsch and textbooks and others, the prevalence of PAD. The first message I think we're going to hear multiple times today is that PAD is a disease of the elderly. As you age, the prevalence goes up. The other message that's important to recognize is that we fully don't understand the prevalence as the disease is likely larger than what may be diagnosed amongst all the epidemiologic studies. I'll speak for a moment about the risk factors. They include many of the things you see on this slide, um, but most specifically diabetes, tobacco use, renal insufficiency, and many of the other atherosclerotic risk factors we're aware of. Throughout the evidence review, you're going to hear us speak of sort of two consequences of PAD, as you've heard already. The first is functional capacity, quality of life. There'll be also limb symptoms that we'll try to speak to. And then there'll be consequences of PAD that are both patient-specific cardiovascular events and limb-specific. So everything from amputation tissue loss to myocardial infarction, death, and stroke. And in fact, the goals of treatment may be to affect both of these where the risk of those, what we'll say, irreversible damage is high and certainly symptomatic risk occurs. The goals of therapy for PAD are in all patients for PAD, we aim to reduce cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. The evidence review will walk through some of the questions we asked with regards to that. In patients with intermittent claudication, referred to as IC on this slide and in future slides, it's to improve their functional status and to reduce their morbidity and mortality from the disease. And in patients with critical limb ischemia, it's to prevent amputation, restore mor mobility and the ability to ambulate, and then reduce their mortality. Reducing cardiovascular mortality and morbidity has clearly been described previously, and strategies that can be included include antiplatelet agents, angiotensin converting enzymes, and other types of specific modifying therapies, and then risk factor management, some of which we will not spend a long time in the evidence review on. Two specific therapies for peripheral artery disease and functional capacity include salostazole and pentoxifiline. These are the proposed mechanisms, although to be frank, the exact mechanisms are not clear for both ag um, agents. Um, Solosazole is said to prevent blood clots, maybe a potential antiplatelet effect, may affect a vasodilatory effect. It does have some noted side effects and is contraindicated patients with heart failure. Pentoxifiline prevents potentially some of the same mechanisms. It should be noted in our evidence review that started more recently, most of the evidence was aimed at solosazole rather than pentoxifiline, and Dr. Jones will cover that. We will also review exercise training and functional capacity. Exercise therapy is aimed at improving endothelial function, reducing systemic inflammation, and improving the actual way the muscle manages the oxygenation and maybe changes how the skeletal muscle uses the flow. We'll also spend some time looking at revascularization. The goals of revascularization, of course, are to restore blood flow, potentially improve wound healing, and prevent amputation. And revascularization may depend on a variety of factors shown on this slide, many of which I think people will speak to. The strategies that we specifically evaluated um, are surgery versus endovascular therapy. Although we know there are many opportunities with each of those, surgery has lower extremity bypass with many possible opportunities and end arterectomy. There's angioplasty with some drug eluding balloons that are not shown on this slide and other therapies, stenting and atherectomy, multiple types of strategies. Many used in combination, many used in hybrid procedures we will review the evidence for what we have for those procedures. The endpoints are the endpoints that you've heard. We'll look at cardiovascular endpoints, all-cause mortality, MI, and stroke, quality of life. We looked at limb-specific endpoints based on our technical panel of functional capacity, major amputation, amputation-free survival, wound healing, and then revascularization endpoints, as you can see. So it's with that I'm going to have Dr. Jones review the evidence review, and then we'll come up with some conclusions for you. Thanks, Vinesh. Thank you to the MedCAC panel for allowing us to present our data. This was a two-year process. Uh, this document is available on the AHRQ website. Uh, it's also, um, this data has been published in four uh, manuscripts that are available online as well. As we constructed the analytical framework that I show here on, in this slide, you can see on the left-hand upper slide that we use the uh, patient characteristics that Manesh talked about asymptomatic, symptomatic patients with claudication and symptomatic patients with critical limb ischemia. We specifically looked at interventions in the middle part of this slide uh, that consists of antiplatelet uh, agents for all groups of patients, 
uh, interventions for intermittent cl claudication, including exercise training, medical therapy, endovascular intervention, and surgical intervention. And then specifically for critical limb ischemia patients, we looked at interventions including endovascular and surgical revascularization. Like we've already said, the outcomes that we're using uh, include cardiovascular events, amputation, quality of life, functional capacity, and then other limb-specific um, outcomes. With each of these questions, we looked at modifiers of effectiveness, so subgroups of patients, including age, race, sex, and others. We also looked at the safety of these uh, interventions with each group. With that analytical framework in mind, I'll go through the three key questions that we constructed and then tried to answer. The first key question, I'll refer back to these as key question one, or KQ1, was in all patients with peripheral artery disease, what is the comparative effectiveness of aspirin and other antiplatelet agents in reducing these outcomes? Similar to each of the other key questions, you can see that does the effectiveness of these treatments vary? So are there modifiers of effectiveness or subgroups uh, that are treated differently? And then C, what are the safety concerns with uh, these interventions? So KQ1, or key question one, is antiplatelet agents in all uh, patients with peripheral artery disease. Key question two revolved around intermittent claudication. So it uh, specifically states, what is the comparative effectiveness of exercise training, medical therapy, endovascular intervention, which includes all types of endovascular intervention and surgical intervention or surgical revascularization on these outcomes. And does this treatment, uh, is, does this, uh, the effectiveness of this treatment vary according to subgroups? And then uh, what are the safety concerns of each? Now, uh, to highlight this, we actually looked at uh, specifically between treatment strategies rather than within treatment strategies. I'll show you some of that data on coming slides. Key question three revolved around critical limb ischemia patients, and it specifically stated, what is the comparative effectiveness of endovascular intervention and surgical revascularization for these outcomes? How did these treatments vary according to the subgroup, and then what were the safety concerns? Those are our three key questions, the answers to which I'll present over the next few minutes. We used the AHRQ methods guide to grade the strength of evidence for each comparison, and I'll uh, describe each of those. Um, high strength of evidence uh, suggests that further research is very unlikely to change the confidence in the estimate Moderate means that further research may change the confidence in the estimate. Low means that further research is likely to change the confidence. And then if there's insufficient evidence, it means that evidence either is unavailable or does not permit um, an estimation of the effect. We performed this search in March, uh, I'm sorry, in August of 2012. Uh, we specifically limited our questions to, uh, to 1995 to the time the search was done in 2012. As you can see, almost 6,000 uh, citations were identified. Some of those were duplicate entries. We then reviewed almost 5,000 separate articles uh, during our uh, literature review. You can see of those almost 5,000 abstracts, 11 qualified specifically for key question one on antiplatelet agents. 35 qualified for treatment specific to intermittent claudication patients. And then 37 qualified for um, treatments of patients with CLI. We'll start with the key question one antiplatelet analyses. We were able to identify three specific comparisons, aspirin versus placebo, or no antiplatelet agent, clopidogrel versus aspirin, and then clopidogrel plus aspirin, dual antiplatelet therapy versus aspirin alone. 
As I move through these slides, you'll see that uh, I did include forest plots for estimation of effect. I'll describe that and then give you the summary of these results as we go. In the aspirin versus placebo comparison, you can see that we looked at the composite vascular events at two or more years, so longer term outcomes. You can see based on that in asymptomatic patients, the hazard ratios were actually right at one suggesting that there's no difference in all-cause mortality, non-fatal MI, or composite vascular events in the patients who are asymptomatic, and the strength of evidence here was high. For patients in the third study with intermittent claudication, there are wide confidence intervals, and therefore the strength of evidence for this was low. There were no studies looking at functional outcomes, quality of life, or safety concerns, and therefore it was graded as insufficient. For the comparison of clopidogrel versus aspirin, the, uh, the data was taken entirely from a subgroup of the Capri study, so PAD patients included in the Capri study. You can see that there were 6,452 patients. In this, you can see that there was, uh, that clopidogrel was more effective for reducing non-fatal myocardial infarction, cardiovascular mortality, and composite vascular endpoints and we graded this with the strength of evidence of moderate. There were not studies that looked at all-cause mortality, functional outcomes, quality of life, or modifiers of effectiveness, and therefore we graded this as insufficient. For the comparison of dual antiplatelet therapy, or clopidogrel plus aspirin versus aspirin alone, there are a total of four studies. Uh, as you can see, some of these were PAD subpopulations or subgroups from larger studies. Some of them were mixed populations of claudication and CLI, and some of them were um, smaller studies of platelet inhibition. We found that there was no difference in all-cause mortality or composite cardiovascular endpoints and graded this with a strength of evidence of moderate. We did uh, find that dual uh, therapy, therapy of clopidogrel plus aspirin, uh, suggested that uh, non-fatal myocardial infarctions were reduced with this therapy when compared to aspirin. We did not find a difference um, for non-fatal stroke or cardiovascular mortality between these comparisons. And then we did find that minor bleeding was significantly higher uh, with dual therapy versus uh, aspirin alone. Although with this there was only one study, it was graded as strength of evidence insufficient. That concludes the description of the comparisons for key question one. We'll move on to key question two, which I'll remind you really is um, comparisons of these types of treatments for patients with intermittent claudication. As I said, we looked at between treatment strategy studies, and I'll explain that a little bit more uh, in the following minutes. Because of the prior HRQ review called Horizon, uh, which studied same treatment strategy comparisons, including angioplasty versus stenting or stenting versus atherectomy, we did not um, uh, repeat this uh, comparison. This study was published in 2008, and I will say that many of these uh, uh, comparisons have actually um, more data now than uh, was present in 2008, but we did not recapitulate this study. Our study really looked at between treatment strategy comparisons, so specifically silosazole versus placebo, exercise training versus usual care, endovascular intervention versus usual care, surgical revascularization versus usual care, and then compared to each other. And we did uh, fixed effects models looking at uh, these comparisons, and then we did a network meta-analysis uh, trying to compare each of these comparisons against each other. And I'll go over those results now. We specifically looked for these patients with claudication at maximal walking distance or absolute claudication distance. When we looked at exercise training, solosazole, endovascular intervention, and then the combination of endovascular intervention with exercise, you can see that the hazard ratios uh, are quite all over the place. When we look at 
supervised exercise and the combination of endovascular revascularization and exercise, you can see that there were large improvements in maximal walking distance when compared to usual care. We graded this as a strength of evidence that's moderate. With celostazole and endovascular revascularization, there was a moderate improvement in maximal walking distance when compared to usual care. We graded this with the strength of evidence of low. When network meta-analysis was done to compare all of these things against each other, you can see that no individual treatment was found to have statistically significant effect when compared to the others. For initial claudication distance or pain-free walking distance, another important endpoint for our claudication patients, you can see we use many of the same comparisons. We concluded that exercise training and endovascular revascularization were found to have moderate to large effects on initial claudication distance or pain-free walking distance. However, the strength of evidence here is low. Celostazole was found to have no statistically significant effect on these outcomes, and the strength of evidence here was also low. When we performed network meta-analysis, there was no individual treatment that was found to have a statistically significant uh, effect when compared to the others, just like the prior outcome. Quality of life is important for our claudication patients. You can see this is actually a network meta-analysis uh, comparing each of the four listed comparators, celosazole, exercise training, endovascular intervention, and surgical revascularization. With this, you can see that uh, each of them had moderate to large effects on quality of life when compared with usual care, although the strength of evidence was low and the heterogeneity was quite high. When we did network meta-analysis comparing each to each other, there was no individual treatment that was found to be statistically significant for quality of life. And we used the short form 36, I'll say, because the disease-specific quality of life measures uh, did not have uh, enough studies to actually compare. We also looked in these claudication patients um, about the effect of these comparators on mortality. We did a network meta-analysis on this. You can see, uh, I'm going to repeat myself here, there's no specific treatment that was found to have uh, a significant effect on mortality as expected in patients with intermittent claudication when they were compared to each other. All right. In addition to these outcomes that I've already described, you can see that there's inconclusive evidence for non-fatal MI, non-fatal stroke, amputation, modifiers of effectiveness, and safety. And we graded the strength of evidence as insufficient here. In addition, there were zero studies looking at composite cardiovascular events, wound healing, pain, and safety in subgroups, um, and graded it also as insufficient for these intermittent claudication patients. Now, outside of uh, the AHRQ review, this was a, a, a study that we performed using the same construct, but without external funding. It was performed after the AHRQ review. You can see that um, we looked at uh, over 6,000 articles. About 5,000, again, uh, were screened at abstract stage. Uh, and 27 were included in this final report of supervised versus home exercise. So I'll highlight again, this was outside of the construct because it was same treatment comparisons, supervised exercise, going to a place to get exercise versus home exercise. And we did a, a systematic review and meta-analysis here. It was published in American Heart Journal. Um, the flow diagram you can see is very difficult to see here. I'll just say that um, I highlighted most of uh, the important facts. And we did um, abstract data from 27 studies, and I'll show you the results here. The same um, outcome, functional outcomes that we talked about before, maximal walking distance and uh, initial claudication distance um, are used. Uh, left panels are maximal walking distance, right panels are initial claudication distance. Panel A, the top panel, is six month outcome and panel B is uh, 12 month outcome. You can see in many of these comparisons, uh, supervised exercise is more effective uh, at improving maximal walking distance and initial claudication distance 
than home exercise. When we look at quality of life, using the same setup here, so um, general quality of life using the short form 36, and then uh, on the left side and then on the right side, the uh, walking impairment questionnaire using six month and 12 month data in top to bottom, you can see that there was no difference in quality of life between supervised exercise and home exercise in our findings. We'll move on to um, key question three, and I'll remind you this is critical limb ischemia patients comparing endovascular intervention and surgical intervention. We did find four articles that looked at endovascular intervention versus usual care. Many of these were mixed populations. Uh, it was difficult uh, to tease anything out of, and the heterogeneity was very high. Therefore, we'll focus on uh, the direct comparisons on the bottom panel, endovascular and surgical revascularization. These are CLI-only patients, so not mixed populations. And you can see that there are 23 studies and almost 13,000 patients. I'll highlight before I show you the results that one of these was a randomized controlled trial. The remainder of these were observational studies. Due to that, we did combine these uh, into point estimates for observational studies and randomized controlled trial uh, studies. And then we gave you an overall point estimate at the bottom of the forest plot. You can see at all-cause mortality at two to three years here, there's no difference between endovascular and surgical revascularization. You can see that amputation-free survival at two to three years is also very similar uh, at, uh, uh, with these findings. To show you more data, at one year there was no difference in primary patency. We graded this with the strength of evidence of moderate. We uh, did uh, show a, a trend that the endovascular revascularization may reduce all-cause mortality at less than six months and improve secondary patency at one year, after one year. There was no difference, though, in all-cause mortality, amputation at all time points, and then amputation-free survival at greater than a year. And however, the strength of evidence here was low based on the number of studies and the quality of studies. There was inconclusive evidence on non-fatal MI, wound healing, primary patency at two years or greater, length of stay, and then modifiers of effectiveness and safety. Uh, when we were asked to present in March, uh, we were asked to update this um, literature uh, review. We did that um, starting in March, and so our uh, updated search terms were from August 2012 until March 2015. 1,700 uh, citations were included after we did the literature search, and we performed abstract review on each of these. 61 abstracts were included for full text review, and I do want to say that there, there were 25 individual full text articles that were reviewed for qualitative review, but we did not repeat uh, our meta-analysis and systematic review. I'll show you some of the uh, studies that were um, thought uh, to fit into the constructs of our review, but again, we did not perform quantitative meta-analysis with these updated studies. There are a total of seven uh, studies for KQ1, so again, the antiplatelet study of all patients with PAD. Only four of these are good studies. You can see Dr. Ben Benaka um, did a subgroup analysis looking at uh, Boropaxar. Um, Dr. Patel behind me did a subgroup analysis of Ticagalor versus clopidogrel in a PAD subgroup. And then there were two uh, studies uh, below that of um, slightly lower numbers. But again, four good quality studies um, uh, to add to the evidence review for antiplatelet agents. When we look at uh, key question two, so the intermittent claudication uh, study, um, or comparators. Only one good quality study out of 13 that were included um, uh, we would have called good quality, and that was the 18-month update. 79 patients from the CLEVER study um, looking at um, aortoiliac stenosis, um, exercise, endovascular revascularization, and medical therapy. For key, uh, key question three, critical limb ischemia for the updated literature search, there are eight studies. 
None of them were graded as good studies or good quality studies. Three of those eight had a mixed population of intermittent claudication and CLI, and therefore the heterogeneity was quite high. And so from all of this, we um, uh, concluded that there was limited, uh, a limited impact of the updated evidence for either KQ2 or KQ3. All right, I'll conclude here by going through the key questions with our findings. You can see for the aspirin versus placebo comparison, there was no benefit for preventing vascular events in asymptomatic PAD patients with the strength of evidence that's high. Aspirin uh, was favored for reducing non-fatal MI and combined vascular events in all intermittent claudication patients, although the strength of evidence was low. Clopidogrel monotherapy versus aspirin monotherapy. Clopidogrel favored, was favored for reducing adverse cardiovascular outcomes in PAD subgroups from Capri, graded that as strength of evidence moderate. And then with dual antiplatelet therapy versus um, aspirin monotherapy, you can see that there was no difference in uh, reducing stroke, cardiovascular mortality, uh, or other outcomes in PAD subgroups, intermittent claudication, or CLI patients. And we graded that as strength of evidence moderate. We did uh, find that dual therapy uh, was favored for reducing non-fatal MI at the cost of minor bleeding in this population. So I'll give you the conclusions for KQ2 and KQ3 next. You can see in orange here, exercise or endovascular revascularization versus usual care. It favored exercise training for improved walking distance with a large effect. Strength of evidence here was moderate. It favored endovascular revascularization for improving walking distance, and that uh, effect was moderate and the strength of evidence was low. I apologize, there's a um, mistake here in the green panel. This should be endovascular intervention versus usual care, and you can see that Endovascular intervention was favored for functional improvement, but not quality of life. Uh, the, this was a moderate effect, and the strength of evidence was high. And then when you look at the combination of endovascular intervention plus exercise versus exercise alone or endovascular intervention alone in claudicants, that the combination of endovascular intervention and exercise improved maximal walking distance with a large effect, and strength of evidence was moderate. For KQ3, critical limb ischemia patients, you can see that we did not find a difference uh, in effectiveness between endovascular intervention and surgical interventions uh, in this population. We did also did not find a difference in all-cause death at greater than a year, amputation at all time points, and amputation-free survival at greater than a year. Although the strength of evidence was low and the heterogeneity was high. So, as I conclude here, I'll tell you about the limitations of our evidence base that we looked at. I'll tell you that there were few published large-scale randomized controlled trials comparing antiplatelets in PAD patients. There were few direct comparisons of treatment strategies in general in patients with claudication. Uh, same treatment strategies uh, were excluded in our analysis because they had been studied previously and published uh, by AHRQ. No studies comparing a majority of treatment strategies uh, occurred in patients with atypical leg pain. And then we were unable to stratify uh, analyses by disease severity, risk, or symptoms because the available evidence didn't support it. So the challenges that exist before I let Manesh come back and conclude are that there are population differences, differences that are often poorly described, endpoint differences that haven't been similar across studies, some of our biggest challenges was actually finding length of follow-up that uh, were similar so that we could compare them. Obviously, uh, revascularization has evolved uh, over the last 10 to 20 years, and that's poorly captured in these studies. And then there was little to no uh, evidence to suggest which treatment was better in terms of a crossover from one therapy to the next. I'll let Manesh conclude here with the last five slides. Thanks, Skylar. I think we're just going to, to be on time, walk through a few more recent data just on, since the evidence review, what are the population data that we are aware of? Some of these data are taken from large administrative data sets that may be informative to the group. 
Uh, the first is this uh, one published by uh, Scholar and others here on the temporal trends and geographic variation of lower extremity amputation patients with PAD. This is from 2002-2008. Subsequent publications of Journal of Vascular Surgery and others have shown us that, in fact, as you look at the top panel, um, thankfully, um, the amputations are going down uh, across the United States, it seems, but there's still a large regional variation, as you can see on the map of the United States. Also, you can see there's some trends in the settings for the vascular interventions from both uh, inpatient setting to the outpatient setting and, of course, multiple specialties represented here performing the procedures. I will also say that uh, many in the room worked with the uh, FDA and uh, many stakeholders to generate uh, consensus definitions for uh, patients with peripheral arterial disease, a document called PARC. Hope is that uh, future studies will use uh, similar definitions for outcomes and safety events, and so that will help with the future. Um, when we uh, end here by talking about what studies are coming, this is a publication in 2014 in circulation where we reviewed on uh, CTGov for all the PAD ongoing uh, studies and concluded that um, there was a low number compared to the other cardiovascular disease states. And uh, it was also concerning in that there was geographic really limitation in where patients were being recruited from in the United States for PAD. We did update this search uh, for this meeting. Uh, we tried to look at CTGov for all studies of patients greater than 500 patients in randomized comparison, so it's a bit uh, selected, but we, we look for randomized trials. There are large registries and other ongoing studies, and in the randomized comparison space, we found two that I think people will speak to some here. The first is uh, an ongoing large randomized trial uh, looking at ticagrelor versus clopidogrel in patients with peripheral artery disease with the expected enrollment there of uh, 13,500 and a report out date potentially next year. And then I think we're going to hear from BEST, CLI, and others about an open-label randomized trial of endovascular versus surgical revascularization in patients with critical limb ischemia. With, thank, uh, with that, I want to thank the AHRQ for funding the evaluation, and thank you all for your patience as we uh, went through the data. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for that detailed review, and uh, thank you also for actually being ahead of time. Uh, so. Uh, I'd like to welcome Dr. Jack Cronenwet, uh, Medical Director, uh, Society for Vascular Surgery Patient Safety Organization, Professor of Surgery at Dartmouth. Thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, I think we have uh, your slides, Matt. <laughs> should we switch order or should we switch slides? Uh, We'll go ahead and we'll, we'll switch order. Unless yeah. we get, well, where, go ahead, where are these? Oh, we may be ahead technologically. Do you want to tell a few jokes while we get this? Well, <laughs> well I'll, if I, I'll start. Uh, so, so I'm here as the medical director of a vascular quality initiative, and as you've just heard, uh, in many cases, the, the, uh, the evidence that we're basing all of these decisions, treatment decisions on, is moderate and sometimes even low. And uh, the, what I'm going to tell you about this morning is the potential use of clinical registries to develop the type of evidence that we need in real-world practice to help us in the future to uh, be better able to make these decisions. And. Um, I have no disclosures, and now I need my slides. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're working on them. So, so the, uh, the Vassar Quality Initiative was launched uh, by the Society for Vassar Surgery in 2011. Here it is, but we, it really is multi-specialty. And uh, it was launched as a quality initiative to uh, improve quality, safety, and effectiveness and, and reduce costs of our vascular care and it incorporates a national registry that's housed in a patient safety organization, so it's somewhat unique in that regard. It's unique because it uses 18 regional groups around the U.S. that take responsibility for practice change in their region, and it has a real-time uh, web-based reporting system and data collection system. And although hospitals or, or physician groups pay for the privilege of, of submitting data, uh, the growth has continued uh, as they recognize the value, and you can see it's quite widely distributed around the United States. The value of, of a patient safety organization for collecting these type of data is quite significant. Uh, it first allows the, the data to be collected for quality improvement without informed consent. 
It protects the work product, which means any comparative data from discovery, which encourages honest reporting. It precludes comparative data to be used uh, for disciplinary purposes or for marketing. But it does allow us to publish, if you will, non-identifiable data for uh, research purposes. So it really is an ideal, ideal vehicle, we believe. And it is, uh, in the past, been focused only on procedural uh, topics. So we look at the procedure data and the subsequent uh, outcomes. But we're actually in the peripheral artery disease arena now working on a medical management module that we're going to implement in early 2016. And so it has a lot of bearing on what we're talking about today. The advantages uh, of this uh, are, are somewhat obvious, but allow, it allows us to collect data on all the patients, not just those who gave informed consent, so it should be non-biased. It certainly has much more detailed information than is available from administrative claims, and we collect many variables about the preoperative status of the patient that could influence their outcome, the, the, the treatment details that likely influence outcome, and then, of course, the outcome. We're able to collect one-year follow-up in over 70% of the patients when they return to the practitioner's office. And in the last year, we've been able to match the data with Medicare claims to really look at even longer downstream uh, intervention and outcome events. And we're able to then report to the practitioners real-time data such as these uh, that I just selected for uh, freedom from amputation uh, after uh, PVI for critical limb ischemia, where shown in blue the national results and in red the center results, or the same type of data for uh, lower extremity bypass. And these are real time, can be pulled up at any point by the hospital or the physician to compare themselves with others. And since we've started this, uh, uh, we've collected over 200,000 procedures, now collecting about 7,500 per month. And if we focus on the PAD space, you can see that we have over 100,000 procedures in the registry that are uh, applicable to the type of, to answering the type of questions that we're, we're asking today. So uh, a few uh, highlights. We have a large number of patients, obviously, with some long-term follow-up. And I'll give you a few examples of what we've been able to do with this type of information. Um, uh, looking at the question of medications and how useful they are in the real world in these patients, we decided to look at the value of antiplatelet agents combined with statins if they were simply prescribed to the patient when they were discharged from the institution after receiving one of these uh, treatments for peripheral disease. And then uh, we looked at the, at the outcome. Well, the first thing we saw was there was huge variation across the centers in the rate that these uh, medications were prescribed for these peripheral arterial procedures highlighted here in red. So there's huge variation. But what we found amazingly was that if these medications were prescribed and we looked at the long-term survival of the patient, there was a 26% absolute improvement in five-year survival. And that's almost impossible to achieve uh, compared with patients who received neither of these medications at the time of discharge. And we also found that the longer a center was participating in VQI, the more follow-up and feedback reports and more encouragement they obtained, their rate of, of, of use on average went from 58 to 70 percent uh, over the, those number of years. So if we have big data like this, we can also use it to answer other clinical questions that we can't necessarily answer based on an individual's practice. And so we looked uh, at, a, at a common problem after surgical bypass, which is infection at the surgical incision. It's a high cause of morbidity. And we, you can see across the VQI centers that it ranges as high as 30%. There's quite a bit of variation compared to the expected predicted value. And when we looked at modifiable risk factors, we found that if you shorten your operation or reduce your blood transfusion rate, it will reduce infection. But we also found if you simply change the skin prep, and use chlorhexidine instead of iodine, it would reduce the infection rate by half. And so we, we then uh, sent this information out to centers, to individual centers, and showed them specifically how in their center, what their opportunity profile for improvement was. So this center had an opportunity to improve their chlorhexidine usage rate. They had a 9.4% infection rate. And then the question was, if we gave them this feedback, 
would they change their practice or how rapidly would they change their practice? And we believe that if they had confidence in the data, they might change more rapidly than conventional wisdom says the literature doesn't influence us that much. So we sent these reports out and within two months, the rate of chlorhexidine usage changed from 79% to 93%. And in those centers where they changed their chlorhexidine usage and had a significant increase, they had a concomitant marked reduction in their surgical site infection rate. So we're now able to push out reports uh, electronically to members, hospitals, and individual physicians to give them very detailed information, such as the data shown here, that show them all the factors that influence length of stay after a certain procedure and what their opportunity is for their hospital, what they can change compared to others to reduce that length of stay. So uh, as I mentioned, the, the, one of the things we have to ensure in a registry is, is a comprehensive registry. It's just not a registry, a voluntary registry. And we ensure that by auditing the procedures each year against hospital claims to be sure that every procedure was submitted. If it's not submitted, they have to go back and submit it. We capture 99% of procedures that were done. We then use statistically based audits where we identify potential underreporting and audit those procedures in those hospitals to be sure that they're accurate. We have a lot of opportunity to do comparative effectiveness analysis because we look at open surgical procedures versus all the endovascular procedures. And as I mentioned, starting next year, we're going to be looking at some of the medical management that you're going to hear about today. And then finally, this is real world practice. It's not just academic centers and it's not just surgeons. So here's a distribution of the hospital types. It's perfectly divided between academic and affiliated and community hospitals. And if you look at the types of physicians who are participating among all the 2,500 procedures, it's, uh, there is a dominance of surgeons. But if you look at the procedures, the peripheral interventional procedures where other specialists participate, it's actually half surgeons and half non-surgeons, and it's equally divided in the half between cardiologists and radiologists. So it's a very nice distribution of real-world practice. So what have we learned that is really applicable to what we're talking about today? Um, you've heard that the evidence levels are low, and you would think, therefore, that that would lead to tremendous variation in how we interpret the data. Uh, and that's absolutely true. So if we look at how do we select patients and which type of intervention do we select if we decide to treat them. If we look at uh, how we're treating PAD, when we're treating it, uh, we, we heard about the ABI as a measure of severity of disease. You know that patients with claudication, the intervention is much more subjective based on the patients of the, the disability that it's causing in different patients. So we decided to look at how much the ABI varied in patients who were selected for treatment across these centers because if we all agreed we would all be operating or intervening at the same ABI. Well it doesn't work out that way. Uh, so you can see here the, the blue line is the ABI of patients who were treated for claudication with peripheral intervention and the red line is the ones who were treated with bypass. So the bypass patients had worse ABI, worse circulation if you will, but there was huge variation. So if you look at the far right in this slide, those were centers that had a very low threshold. They treated patients with relatively high ABI. And at the bottom, you see patients that were very, had very poor circulation. So there's, there's little agreement, which is not surprising based on the evidence. But there's an opportunity to learn from this. And then how do we decide which treatments we apply? We heard from Schuyler that there's not much difference in in terms of evidence between endovascular or surgical intervention, and so you might expect there would be variation. Well, there is. If we look at the, the treatment of claudicants overall in VQI, 26% were treated with bypass, so most were treated with PVI, but it varied from 0% treated with bypass to 76%. So there was a lot of variation. If we look at critical limb ischemia, there's even more variation. It's 100% variation. Some centers 0% treated with bypass, other centers 100% of the same type of patients treated with bypass, obviously influenced by many factors. So we're using uh, VQI to generate uh, evidence now. Uh, we have um, 
over 50 national and 100 regional projects that are focused on quality improvement but that generate evidence for use by all, over 60 publications in the last three years. And I've just listed a few of the topics on the slide, but they range across the board. But we're certainly beginning to look very, in a very focused way at outcomes around these different interventions to try to understand which patients benefit from which procedures, which is something that's really hard to understand from uh, a meta-analysis in the literature, but quite easy to understand if you have 100,000 patients with detailed clinical data. So uh, I think in conclusion, what I would say is that registries can provide very valuable real-world evidence about when is treatment appropriate. And by appropriate treatment, we mean the correct indication so patient selection, the correct treatment, the procedure selection, and the correct outcome, both early, late, and patient reported. Uh, so I think that, medic, that registries, comprehensive registries that have the appropriate safeguards to be sure that the data are accurate can inform uh, Medicare coverage decisions based on appropriateness assessment. And so, and I'll just uh, close by saying that what what CMS and other payers can do to promote this type of evaluation is first to encourage participation. And how can that be done? Well, uh, first we ought to differentiate registries. We need to have a, some type of mechanism to certify registries who are doing it right, are collecting the type of information that we can rely on. And second, we need to do something to incent participation. And I believe that it would be appropriate to increase payments for providers and centers that participate in qualified registries and to reduce payment for those who don't. And second, uh, we need to encourage proper outcome assessment. And so if we, uh, we need to provide certified registries with better access to claims data, both Medicare and ideally private payer claims, we need to incent providers somehow for entering the detailed information that we need that's not available in the claims. And I believe we need to provide more grant support to these type of registries so that we can all implement uh, patient reported outcomes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Cronenbet. Uh, I'd like to welcome Dr. Matthew Menard, co-director endovascular surgery, program director vascular surgery fellowship in the Division of Vascular and Endovascular Surgery at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you very much. Uh, really appreciate the effort to speak on the trial and what we've been trying to do with the BCLI trial uh, to CMS and to this audience. These are my disclosures. The trial is an NIH, NHLBI funded trial. And I'm speaking today on behalf of a number of people that have devoted uh, an enormous amount of work uh, to the effort to date. My fellow uh, Clinical Coordinating Center principal investigators are Alec Farber, who's the Chief of Vascular Surgery at Boston Medical Center. I'm a vascular surgeon at the Brigham Women's Hospital. Kenny Rosenfield is here today. He'll be speaking a little bit later. Uh, he is an interventional cardiologist at Massachusetts General Hospital. Megan Dunn is our National Trial Coordinator. We have partnered with New England Research Institutes, and Sandy Siami and Susan Osman are the uh, uh, co-PIs of that effort. We have some incredibly talented uh, cost-effectiveness uh, folks from the Brigham Women's, Jerry Aborn and Natish Chowdhury, and we've had tremendous support from the NIH and Diane Reed and George uh, Sopko, our, our advisors. So, uh, you know, really you couldn't get a better lead-in to our trial than uh, Skylar and Manesh uh, coupled with, with Jack to really lay the groundwork for why we decided to do this and why we think it's an important trial and what we're hoping to achieve with it. So I'm not going to spend too much time on uh, the background of what's been done to date uh, other than a few slides. I'm going to try to give you a flavor of what the trial uh, is about, uh, the architecture of the trial. And, and uh, the progress to date. But clearly, uh, critical limb ischemia, as everyone in the room knows, is associated with tremendous morbidity and mortality. It's increasing worldwide. It's showing no signs of letting up. And untreated, uh, again, uh, many problems. So uh, there's a big spectrum within critical limb ischemia from 
uh, folks with breast pain whose peripheral exam would not be uh, too distinguishable from normal patients to those with uh, folks with varying ulcers. This is a painful ischemic ulceration. This is some dry gain green. This is a diabetic uh, malperfins ulcer and someone probably with neuropathy and associated uh, peripheral arterial disease. And this is probably the most feared uh, patient we see, one with a very challenging keel ulcer and needs uh, extremely good uh, perfusion to salvage the limb. We all know about the explosion of endovascular therapy over the last number of years um, and the changing demographics in terms of who's treating CLI. The slide you just see, uh, you just saw is, is quite prevalent. The, the group uh, from Dartmouth and Phil Goodney's uh, efforts have recently updated uh, that slide and the trends are showing no signs of changing. The, uh, top slide is angiography. The uh, increase in slope, again, is intervascular intervention, and surgery uh, is on the bottom. The REACH registry tells us that we actually spend more money on peripheral arterial disease than we do on critical limb ischemia in the United States. And really, in 2015, we have a number of options to treat challenging CLI patients. We have medical therapy. It's not particularly effective, as you just saw. We do an increasing number of hybrid procedures. We have primary amputation, and that's appropriate at times. But really, and frequently, it's a choice between uh, surgical therapy and endovascular therapy, and that's the backbone of the trial, trying to answer this question, which is best. When you look across the landscape of uh, vascular uh, disease, we have a number of high-quality level one studies to guide us in the realm of carotid disease, carotid stenting versus carotid endarterectomy and aneurysmal disease, when one looks at CLI, there's really a single uh, study that attempted to answer the questions that we're attempting to answer, and that's the basal trial. The data, as again Manesh and Skyler very uh, expertly reviewed, is extremely limited. There is a large void in helping us to decide what to do for a given patient in front of us. The trials are largely retrospective, they're very poorly controlled. The gold standard endpoint of amputation-free survival falls short in terms of really assessing the relevant outcome uh, to the therapy that was provided. Target lesion and target vessel revascularization are appropriate for the coronary uh, anatomy world, but not particularly well suited to critical limb ischemia. Sponsor bias and operator bias are prevalent in the studies to date. Again, as you saw, there are many studies that have mixed claudicants and CLI, and the follow-up has really been suboptimal to date. The basal trial was a very valiant effort. It definitely provided us with information that we use. What it did show, no significant difference in amputation-free survival at five years with a trend to benefit for surgery in those that survived more than two years. What are the limitations of the basal trial? Certainly it was underpowered. Probably the biggest limitation in the eyes of those of us who treat CLI is that endovascular therapy was limited to angioplasty alone. This study was carried out over 10 years ago in England. The practice patterns in Britain are extremely uh, different than they are in the United States and Canada. There was a lack of lesion standardization. It was difficult to determine who exactly was in the basal trial. And again, the, the endpoint of amputation-free survival was limited. This is an article written 24 years ago by Sean Tunis, who used to be the head of CMS, uh, uh, published widely on cost-effectiveness research. This trial, or this article could have come out this year in terms of what little has changed. He looked at angioplasty versus bypass versus amputation. The concept was that as angioplasty took off, surgery would decrease, amputation would decrease. That's exa uh, exactly what's actually happened. Recent studies have mirrored uh, this concept. Unfortunately, costs have not uh, come down as was predicted in this, in this paper. In fact, they've done the exact opposite. So in trying to take on the concept of a, a clinical trial to study uh, the question at hand, it really gets to what is the equipoise. And uh, equipoise is comprised of two important components. The first is our individual equipoise. What, what I, as a vascular surgeon, uh, bring to each indiv individual patient in front of me, what are the question marks in my mind, and those, and the complete opposite, which is my view of when I'm not confused, what, I, what my strongly held bias is, 
and that's compared to the strongly held bias of a completely different group of care providers. They could be within the same specialty or they could be across specialties. So I've just got a couple of slides to highlight what the equipoise challenge is. I can tell you that my belief, having undertaken this endeavor for about eight years now, is that the degree of equipoise across the country is extremely high. It's probably the biggest reason why we've had enormous support for the trial. Uh, a, a big thanks to many people in the audience who are partaking in the trial and are doing the hard work of enrolling patients at their given sites. But this is a challenging patient with a plantar heel ulcer, needs a, uh, as much blood as she can possibly get to her foot. She's got an excellent vein, excellent inflow, as you see from this angiogram, uh, a typical diabetic pattern where she has tibial disease. And you might wonder why I'm providing this slide to talk about equipoise, the vast majority of providers would provide endovascular therapy to this particular patient. In fact, that's what I did. We got a good angiographic result, but I can tell you that I have very little understanding of how long this result's going to last. It might last three days, three months, three years. It may or may not bring her the blood flow she needs to salvage her foot in a very challenging clinical situation. More typically, when one talks about equipoise, we're looking at patients such as this with challenging long segment superficial femoral artery and popliteal disease throw in some multi-level tibial disease as well, and the questions in terms of what the right thing to do uh, becomes even harder to answer. Again, a typical patient with uh, a classic right toe ulceration. This is a very typical angiographic appearance of someone with critical limb ischemia and long systemic disease. Uh, Kenny as a cardiology and I as a vascular surgeon frequently debate patients just like this. He'll think, absolutely, this is a chip shot. Uh, patients should be done endovascular. I have a little bit of a surgical bias and say I would absolutely treat this with surgical therapy. As we uh, traverse the country and poll audiences, I can tell you that the degree of equipoise in question in patients exactly like this is extremely high. Again, supports the need for the trial, the enthusiasm for the trial, and the questions exactly that we're trying to answer. Jack showed you this slide. You couldn't get a better example of the equipoise that I've been talking about across the United States and Canada. And so with that background in mind, I'm just going to uh, highlight the components of the, of the trial and how we tried extremely hard to look at all the efforts to date, look at the Basel trial, try to design a trial that would be feasible and would uh, get to the exact information that we wanted to answer. The objective was to compare treatment efficacy, functional outcomes, and cost in patients who are going, undergoing best open surgical or best endovascular revascularization. The trial is a prospective, randomized, multi-center, open-label superiority trial, 2,100 patients at 120 clinical sites in the United States and Canada. Each patient will have at least two years of follow-up, and the trial was generously funded by the NHLBI to nearly $25 million. It is really two trials in one. The first cohort is so-called best-case surgical scenario with patients who have adequate single-segment saphenous vein, and they will be randomized open versus endo. The second smaller cohort is everyone else, so-called disadvantaged conduit, and they, again, will be randomized separately and powered separately open surgical for endovascular treatment. We had the ability to look a little bit more closely at several variables. We thought clinical presentation or the questions of ischemic rest pain versus tissue loss and the anatomic question of presence or absence of significant tibial disease were worthy of, uh, of further uh, investigation and patients will be stratified for these variables. A key component is that the trial is pragmatic, unlike Basil, unlike the CORAL trial, unlike many other trials that specify a specific platform that a given investigator may or may not uh, approve of or like. We left the definition of best treatment to each individual investigator. So everyone participating in the trial can treat patients with critical, emia, critical limb ischemia exactly how they see fit and how they're typically doing it. We do have an investigational uh, device exemption. This has thrown some people off. We're not in any way examining new or experimental therapies. We are merely allowing every participant to do what we do on a daily basis, and that is to use FDA-approved devices on an off-label fashion and continue to get paid for it. All surgical bypass techniques and conduits are allowed. We do have a committee that assesses new technologies that comes online. They recently met 
and approved both drug-eluting balloons that were recently approved by the FDA. A lot of thought and discussion about what the appropriate endpoint is. The Society of Vascular Surgery convened a committee that looked at trial endpoints, the OPG committee, and they came up with a number of novel endpoints uh, thought to be better suited to clinical trials. We borrowed heavily from that committee's results and major adverse, major adverse limb event free survival was the endpoint that we thought was most appropriate for our, our trial. Male is defined as above ankle amputation, a major reintervention, uh, which includes a new bypass graft, a jumper interposition graft revision, or a thrombectomy or thrombolysis. What it does not include is minor reinterventions, and there was some enthusiasm that this uh, reintervention and amputation free survival would have been the more appropriate endpoint. We thought that would unfairly uh, bias the trial against endovascular therapy, so we ended up keeping uh, the original endpoint. But we are well powered for this endpoint that includes both major and minor reinterventions. We are well powered for the gold standard of amputation free survival and male perioperative death. We are uh, taking a novel look at endpoints that many of us feel are very valuable and have been long missing from other efforts, and this is freedom from hemodynamic failure, freedom from clinical failure, and analogous to the cancer world, freedom from critical limb ischemia. Again, we are going to be well uh, focused on reinterventions, number of reinterventions per limb salvaged, freedom from secondary reinterventions, major and minor, and additional endpoints you see here. The typical safety endpoints you would expect and hope for, MACE, non-serious adverse events, and perioperative complications. And just a word on the cost effectiveness and comparative effectiveness efforts of the trial. So a typical trial uh, that you might see uh, involves an intervention in a control arm. In our case, there's no control arm. It's surgical therapy versus endovascular therapy. A typical trial will look at the outcomes until the trial completion. A typical comparative effectiveness or cost effectiveness trial will throw in the green dollar signs and will look at the uh, accumulating cost of the trial over the course of the trial completion. We are going to attempt to do one thing, one step further, and use Markov modeling based on the results of the core trial to then project the outcomes and the cost over the course of the lifetime of each patient in the trial. So that's a very important component that has not previously been done. Again, the cost effectiveness component will include all the financial costs of care hospital care, outpatient care, rehab rehabilitation. It will include a robust functional status, uh, again, as an additional measure. So we'll look at all treatment-associated costs, both in and outpatient, and use the quality system, again, through Markov modeling to really get a, a solid handle on the economic and functional outcome of each intervention. The vascular qual and the Euroqual and the SF12 are the backbone of the functional endpoints. So switching gears a little bit, another key component of the trial is our efforts to be collaborative. We had an absolute mandate from NHL, BI, that they were not interested in funding a trial that was one specialty alone. We worked hard to include everyone across the country and across Canada that treats CLI, and currently, as representative folks in this room, that includes interventional cardiologists, radiologists, vascular surgeons, and vascular medical specialists. The trial is widely distributed amongst these subspecialties. There's more vascular surgeons, as one might expect, but a, uh, a very appropriate uh, constitution of cardiologists and radiologists. Almost 80 percent of our sites have uh, some representation from multiple specialties participating in the trial. As Jack uh, alluded to and, and Manesh alluded to, we uh, feel it was important to have a wide geographic distribution. We have a good uh, mix of private practice uh, participants and academic centers as well. And for these reasons and other reasons, we've been very fortunate to have the support of multiple societies, Society of Vascular Surgery, uh, in particular, uh, Viva, Society of Vascular Medicine, SIR, Sky, and the FDA have all been incredibly supportive and have helped us throughout our efforts. Put together this trial at a naive time that I thought I could update it. Uh, so it's a little outdated. We have uh, currently almost all of the 120 sites uh, planned, activated, and we've crested 200 subjects enrolled. We have a challenging enrollment uh, uh, um, challenge ahead of us, uh, which is not unexpected, 
and it's somewhat remarkable the parallel progress and the timing of the best trial uh, along with the basal 2 and basal 3. We started almost simultaneously. We have very similar enrollment curves and really the opportunity uh, to combine the best CLI data set with the basal 2 and basal 3 data, uh, data set and really make an impact on the knowledge gap is unprecedented. So in summary, what do we hope to achieve with the best CLI trial? Certainly, we want to assess the role of informal bypass with optimal conduit. We obviously want to uh, assess in a parallel fashion the outcome and the role of endovascular therapy across all aspects of each patient. The bypass when optimal conduit is available compared to endovascular therapy when it's not available, uh, associated quality of life and cost effectiveness, many variables that Manesh and Schuyler highlighted that are of interest to each and every one of us as we struggle with individual patients. Uh, Dr. Mills is going to highlight the, uh, his efforts to develop a much more robust and, and much needed uh, new system of classification. We are utilizing the Wi-Fi classification system and hope to validate it uh, within the confines of the BEST trial. Again, we're going to be taking a close look at hemodynamics everything in synergy with basal two and basal three. And what we're hoping to do is really define an evidence-based standard of care. The trial really has been collaborative. We've been extremely fortunate and pleased to see the degree to which individual sites have risen to the challenge of collaborating. We have a, a CLI team construct. Each patient in the trial has a requirement to be reviewed by two members of the team. Uh, they don't necessarily have to be within specialties or across specialties, but uh, again, the, the end result of this collaboration can only help the trial, can only help everyone, and it's an important component of the trial. So I'll stop there and once again thank CMS for the opportunity to present today and thank everyone across the country that's been hard at work enrolling patients. Uh, thank you very much. So uh, thank you to Dr. Menard and all of the morning speakers. Uh, thank you for staying on time and actually helping us catch up. We're going to follow the agenda, but we're obviously earlier in the day than we have uh, expected to be. I have it now as uh, 9.37. Uh, please come back in 10 minutes. We're going to start again at 9.47 with the scheduled public comments. Hopefully this will give us some room for discussion in the afternoon. Thank you again.
hello. I'd like everyone to please sit down, or you can go out in the hall if you'd like to continue your conversations. We're going to try and start the presentations again. I know. Dr. Gibbons? Good morning, everybody. Dr. Uh, Dr. Gibbons, hold on one second. We're just, I'm waiting for Tamara. Don't take it out of my time. We won't. <laughs> <laughs> Am I on the clock, Marie? <laughs> Yeah, my internal clock. Ah, oh, sorry. You know, the reason it's in Butler Building. Thank you all for coming back. Uh, we're going to start the uh, scheduled uh, uh, comments from the public. Uh, each speaker, hence the, the genesis of Dr. Gibbons' joke, uh, each speaker has only four minutes. Uh, so you have, I guess, 32 seconds left. Uh, so <laughs> and that'll conclude my remarks. <laughs> right, exactly. Are you ready? Yep. Okay, great. I'd like to introduce Dr. Gary Gibbons, who's medical director of the South Sh at South Shore Hospital, Center for Wound Healing, and professor of surgery at Boston University School of Medicine. He is representing the Association for the Advancement of Wound Care. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you all. And uh, I'd like to commend the uh, previous uh, presentations uh, this morning uh, and only to uh, capitalize that on a little bit because I'm going to talk about the wound care that is associated with many of these problems. I'm a vascular surgeon by trade. I was blessed by growing up in the De Deaconess Jocelyn where even Jocelyn, Dr. Jocelyn himself uh, and Dr. Wheelock and others, a patient-centered standard of care, multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary approach to wound care. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of the uh, Association for the Advancement of Wound Care. And uh, we, I think we all agree, we heard it this morning, peripheral arterial disease uh, is present, but what we're seeing now, as the baby boomers are getting older, a lot more comorbid conditions. So it's not pure per, uh, peripheral arterial disease. We're seeing peripheral vascular disease, lymphedema, edema, venous disease, dialysis, combinations affecting these people's lives. And wounds, there are eight million people living with wounds. Uh, for the lower extremity, these wounds are very costly in terms of quality of life and uh, resource utilization. We would like to agree that we need consistent identification of peripheral arterial disease uh, like uh, the uh, uh, specialties treating vascular disease. There are a number of specialties involved in wound care and we too have wide variation in practice, wide variations in outcomes. So we need to come together as one voice following one set of guidelines. We're currently looking at uh, Wi-Fi. Uh, and again, we, you can't have every, uh, some 
some specialty here following one set like Wagner, another following Rutherford. I think this is an opportunity uh, in working together that we can all follow one set of guidelines to really look at the effect of ischemia as well as infection and the microenvironment on the wound and what it does. Uh, PAD is common, but for the diabetic, it is a, an inflammatory vascular disease, and one size does not fit all diabetics. A PAD in one diabetic patient may not mean the same thing in another diabetic patient, especially those who have a limb-threatening wound uh, compromised by peripheral, uh, peripheral vascular disease. Uh, wounds uh, in patients with PAD are seen by multiple specialists. Uh, all uh, listed. You're going to hear many of these people today. What we, what we have found, though, is not all specialties have expertise in wound management. So what we're seeing is inconsistent application of evidence-based treatments like offload, wound management, debridement, compression, and that's an important part of all of the endeavors to get these patients to healing. So again, the most important thing, we, we believe that we need to have somebody on the team in a multi-interdisciplinary approach who has involvement with wound care, who can understand that micro-wound environment in the initial phase of evaluation carried into the post-phase and then important for prevention of reoccurrence. So uh, wound specialists, they need to be involved in uh, creating and following common-based algorithms. We have evidence out there about offloading, compression, and some of the other uh, treatment modalities that are available, but we have wide variation in practice. We've seen evidence of poor debridement in almost 35% of cases, poor compression, less than 60%. Offloading, it's documented only 2% of this country offloads plantar diabetic foot ulcers, yet they won't heal unless they are offloaded. So in uh, question four, which uh, was coming, we need one set of guidelines for the prevention, treatment, education, and research of patients with wounds associated with peripheral arterial disease. And we need to bring people together to establish these guidelines uh, in, in working this out. So please try uh, and wrap up, Dr. Gibbons. Yes, randomized control trials. Uh, they don't have really the real world. They eliminate a lot of patients uh, with ischemia. There are many guidelines out there, a lot of gaps in practice. And again, what about the patients who aren't candidates for vascular reconstruction? So what we're saying is that we need to pay attention to the wounds. Okay. We want to have MedCAC to consider the complexity of these patients, multiple comorbidities. We need to have beneficiaries access to team of services, not just one specific uh, 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 specialty group. You can have the greatest revascularization okay. Dr. Performed. Gibbons, I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you for your t time. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, please don't put me in the uncomfortable position of having you to cut you off. Please stay on time. I'd like to introduce Jeffrey Carr, who's a board member of Cardiovascular Coalition, immediate past president of Outpatient and Vascular Interventional Society. Dr. Carr. Well, thank you. I am Jeff Carr, the immediate past president of the OEIS, or Outpatient Endovascular and Interventional Society. And I'm uh, representing the Cardiovascular Coalition today as a board member. These are my disclosures. I've received no compensation for my time and travel for this meeting today. Well, the Cardiovascular Coalition is comprised of service organizations, industry groups, and multiple physician groups, including the OEIS, which is a multidisciplinary society of vascular surgeons, cardiologists, and radiologists that form together to set standards of care for office based interventional suites. Well, the Cardiovascular Coalition represents 149 freestanding cardiovascular centers in 26 states. It was established to provide policymakers with greater understanding of the value of these freestanding centers. And one of the key focuses of the Cardiovascular Coalition is the utilization of appropriate vascular procedures to prevent non-traumatic amputations in patients. Well, we know that amputations are still uh, vastly underutilizing arterial testing prior to amputation with a pre-amputation ABI testing rate of 47% and lower extremity arteriograms only being performed in less than 40% of patients prior to an amputation. 
Well, the Avulary Health Group uh, recently conducted a study looking at 43,000 Medicare patients who received a major non-traumatic amputation in 2012. And they found that by encouraging revascularization over amputation, we could potentially reduce Medicare direct spending costs by up to $2 billion over 10 years. Now, although medical therapy advances have reduced cardiovascular major events in the cardiac and peripheral vascular patients, these agents have not been demonstrated to improve quality of life and critical ischemia outcomes. Alternatively, uh, de uh, advances in, in innovations in devices in vascular therapy have allowed providers to treat an ever-expanding population of patients who were previously only uh, treated with medical therapy and relegated to conservative management. Well, the AHRQ 2013 study, as we have seen, predominantly analyzed balloon angioplasty and bare metal stents as their primary endovascular revascularization strategies. Well, since 1998, we've seen a growth of multiple devices, numerous atherectomy devices, drug eluting stents, and drug coated balloons that have gained significant adoption over the past 10 years. Well, it's been challenging to compare these different and new devices with studies because up until recently, there have been no established definitions or consensus guidelines for clinical trial endpoints. So the PARC, as we heard, recently convened and just published this year definitions that we hope will add consistency for future PAD trial outcomes. Well, since the ARQ study, we know that there are several trials that have been published uh, which offer a wide spectrum of analysis for all the interventional modalities, including supervised exercise training versus endovascular, directional, laser, and orbital atherectomy, drug loading stents, and drug coated balloons. And there are several current and pending trials, which we are excited about, that will add much more weight to the evidence that the questions that MedCAC is considering today, including observational studies to direct comparative analysis. We've heard the best trial and also real-world analyses and very complex patients and lesion subsets. So in conclusion, intermittent clodicants and critical ischemia patients will benefit from a comprehensive approach of lifestyle modification and revascularization. Interventions that ultimately result in limb preservation offer the best pl uh, possible clinical outcomes. We know that vascular diagnostics are still underutilized in CLI patients uh, despite the proven benefits of revascularization. And by increasing vascular procedures, it's associated with lower amputation rates and reduced healthcare spending. By standardizing outcomes definitions of, and with featured data, we'll be able to increase knowledge for our evidence-based decision making. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Carr. Uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Paul Van Bemmelman, uh, Professor of Vascular Surgery at Temple University. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Good morning. Uh, I will start with the disclosure that I um, patented the first arterial compression device. These are all the pneumatic devices that are currently on the market for PAD. The device puts out a pressure of more than 100 millimeter mercury in a short amount of time. This completely empties the veins in the foot and leg and thereby lowers the venous pressure. Without changing the low pressure in the arteries, this increases the difference in pressure between arteries and veins and increases the flow through the tissue. The increase in flow velocity can be seen immediately upon a single compression shown here in the popliteal artery. Repeating this three hours a day over a three month period at home results in a visible increase in the collateral arteries that develop around the blockages. These collaterals can be 100 times larger than the capillaries created with angiogenesis and can carry 100 million times the amount of blood per minute than a capillary. For intermittent claudication, four different prospective studies have looked at arterial compression. Collectively, 82 patients were compared to 53 controls who received standard exercise and aspirin. The absolute walking distance in all four studies increased by nearly 100 to 200 percent. Compare this to the multicenter cyclosazole trial with only a 29 percent increase in absolute walking distance or the 11 percent increase in the patients who were able, and that's not everybody, to complete a supervised exercise program. So compression is underutilized in patients who do not respond to cellulosazole. Next is CLI. This is an example of 
a Rutherford 5 patient before and after compression treatment. The largest clinical experience has been obtained in Ireland without any support from the industry. 171 patients were treated and closely followed. Almost half these patients were high anesthesia risk. This survival curve demonstrates that non-reconstructable PAD has a worse prognosis than most cancers, with only nine survivors of the 171 after four years. Because of this high mortality, a 94% limb salvage rate was obtainable with compression. Major cost savings were found, better quality of life, and no harms from this intervention. Another study done in Canada showed similar results and had a blinded control group randomized to a placebo device. Two-thirds of the placebo-treated patients lost their leg within two years. So for non-reconstructable PAD, arterial compression should be made more easily available and not restricted. The future question will be a better definition of non-reconstructable and perhaps some guidelines for tibial angioplasty. Here we see two comparable heel ulcers. After successful tibial angioplasty, the one on the bottom still took nine months to heal. The patient on top died two weeks after this picture was taken from a heart attack. So ask yourself, is it wise to spend 20 times more up front on a patient if the survival is so limited? Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Van Bemmelman. I'd now like to introduce Dr. Margaret Doucette, who's the Chief of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation at the Boise VA Medical Center. Good morning. I serve in the VA as Director for the High Risk Foot Program, the Prevention of Amputation and Amputee Care. And I'd like to uh, clarify that I have no disclosures. I also need to clarify that I do not formally represent the VA here today in my opinions. I do represent some of the um, benefits of serving in the VA, hard as it, believe, as it may be to believe there are some. <laughs> and what we've been able to do in our population of patients is utilize the arterial pump. And what's different in the VA is we are allowed to use this based on our clinical decision making, not based on any reimbursement process. We have close to 50 patients now that we're tracking and we're building a robust database. We utilize the Wi-Fi classification system. We have clear processes for vascular evaluation and endpoints. What I'd like to present today are a couple of cases that reflect the trends we're seeing in wound healing, prevention of amputation, and reduction in pain, and increased ambulation. The first case is a 71-year-old veteran who was referred for an ischemic right great toe. He was deemed inoperable. He had severe neuropathy from active alcoholism, smoked incessantly, and had significant pain for which he was using opioids. We attempted to use the pump prior to uh, going to amputation. However, his follow-through was quite poor. And in October of 2014, he underwent a right baloney amputation. He was admitted to our nursing home rehab unit for wound healing and gait training. He was a prosthetic candidate. Unfortunately, he was quite inconsistent with his use of the pump, and at the time of discharge, his gait was limited to 40 to 50 feet due to claudication. Subsequent to his discharge home, however, when he was quite angry and bitter upon discharge, he did start using the pump more consistently, and we saw a very dramatic increase in his gait and his ambulation distance. At the time I saw him two weeks ago, he was ambulating unrestricted. In fact, the only restriction was the therapist's time available to clock his distances. He maintained successful sobriety in part because he states that the pain is so much reduced and he has no need for the alcohol to deal with his pain management. The second case is a 65-year-old gentleman with diabetes known to us for a venous ulcer. He subsequently presented with severe vasculitis from a drug reaction. He had progression of ulceration on his feet due in part to his neuropathy and the mechanical irritation from footwear. He was very noncompliant, failed multiple outpatient visits. He had several admissions for infection. And in his admission in March, 
he was targeted to have an amputation of either at the TMA or BK level. He discharged himself and did start using the pump and using his own words became religious in using the pump. And in May and June presented with significant improvement in healing, such that at his visit two weeks ago, he was completely intact and ambulating without restriction. The last case is a gentleman who is morbidly obese, underwent a left above knee amputation for non-reconstructable disease. He had concurrent disease and pain on the other side. At the time of amputation, we started him on the pump, and now almost two years later, he has maintained an intact limb. He's had multiple superficial injuries from running his wheelchair into various objects and people, but has gone on to heal, and has maintained an intact limb. In summary, I'd like to advocate for having the pump available for those individuals who are not surgical candidates for either the extent of their disease, comorbidities, or self-care deficits. We found it to be cost-effective and clinically effective. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Dr. Doucette. I'd now like to in invite Dr. Michael uh, Dake, department from the Department of Cardiothoracic Surgery at Stanford University School of Medicine, who is here representing uh, Cook Medical. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. I'm an interventional radiologist, and on behalf of Cook Medical, I'd like to present its statement to the panel this morning. These are my disclosures. MedCAC convened today to answer the following questions. For adults with asymptomatic lower extremity PAD, lower extremity intermittent claudication, and lower extremity critical, critical limb ischemia, how confident are you that there is sufficient evidence for an intervention that improves immediate and near-term health outcomes and long-term health outcomes? As global principal investigator of the randomized Silver PTX drug eluting trial, I would like to say that clinical studies with this device should provide confidence in this technology's ability to improve outcomes for patients with intermittent claudication and critical limb ischemia. The Silver PTX drug eluting peripheral stent was developed to address limitations of existing therapies. It has been tested in a clinical program that includes studies along the disease progression continuum in terms of clinical manifestations and anatomic involvement. Starting with the randomized clinical trial and moving on to the single arm study and the Japan post-market surveillance study, the devices has been evaluated in increasingly complex patients and lesions. The Zilver PTX randomized clinical trial allowed for randomization of the DES therapy versus angioplasty and provisional bare metal stent placement. With a mean age of 68 years, the majority of patients enrolled in the randomized clinical trial were Medicare beneficiaries. At five years, Zilver PTX demonstrated a 48% reduction in reintervention compared to standard of endovascular standard of care comprised of optimal PTA or provisional bare metal stenting after failed PTA. Likewise, the patency rates at five years were also statistically significantly different. At five years, Zilver PTX has a superior clinical benefit in terms of rate of freedom from persistent or worsening claudication, rest pain, ulcer, or tissue loss. And this clinical benefit was statistically significantly different when compared to endovascular standard of care. These metrics of freedom from TLR, patency, and clinical benefit were also uh, statistically significantly better than uh, for provisional Zilver PTX versus provisional bare metal stenting. Now beyond the randomized clinical trial, uh, looking at the single arm study and the Japan post-market study, we can see that although the single arm study in Japan PMS did not involve Medicare enrollees, these studies represent a broad real world patient population with a large majority of patients greater than 65 years of age. The increasing complexity of disease across these three studies is manifest by higher frequency of renal failure and renal disease, total occlusions, instant restenosis, and CLI as we go across from left to right. Also note the lesion length increases from 6.6 .6 centimeters up through 10 and 14.7 centimeters. Now despite these differences across the three trials, the overall freedom from TLR is similar. 
in both pre-market studies compared to the randomized clinical trial. Likewise, the overall primary patency by duplex ultrasound is similar in the Japan PMS compared to both pre-market studies. In conclusion, Zilver PTX is the single most rigorously studied device for treatment of PAD of the SFA. Seven completed are ongoing clinical studies for regulatory submissions with greater than 2,400 patients. The five-year data for Zilver PTX demonstrates superior clinical benefit and greater than a 40% reduction in re-intervention and re versus both endovascular standard care and bare metal stents through five years. Consistently positive clinical results in the U.S. Medicare population and similar populations around the world, both in claudicants and CLI, resulted in the CMS granting substantial clinical improvement and, and conferring the new tech DRG add-on status for Zilver PTX. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And now I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Ronald Fairman, uh, who's the Clyde F. Barker William Mall Measy Professor of Surgery, Chief Division of Vascular Surgery and Endovascular Therapy at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. Thank you. Good morning. I'm here representing the uh, Society of Vascular Surgery as now uh, president-elect. I have no disclosures. In addition to the SVS, uh, I'm also representing about 1,300 vascular surgeons who belong to the Society for Clinical Vascular Surgery. And I'll give you a little overview. The SVS represents more than 5,000 practicing vascular surgeons across the United States. We are the nation's oldest medical professional society with a core mission dedicated to the comprehensive management and total care of patients with non-cardiac vascular diseases. By virtue of our ACGME training requirements and the comprehensive nature of our practice, we are uniquely qualified to comment on the scientific evidence of existing interventions that aim to improve health outcomes in the Medicare population and address areas where evidence-based gaps exist related to uh, lower extremity peripheral arterial disease. Specifically, we as vascular surgeons utilize all available modalities, medical, exercise training, and interventional, both endovascular and open surgical, and provide, importantly, longitudinal follow-up of our patients with lower extremity peripheral arterial disease. If you visit my office, you will feel that it is very much akin to a primary care practitioner. Jack alluded to this and gave a very nice talk earlier, but the SVS founded the VQI in 2011 as a registry to collect data about the safety, quality, efficacy, and cost of vascular care. The data is analyzed and shared among regional groups to improve vascular health care. We established a patient safety organization with the Federal Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, and participation requires 100% capture of all procedures and one year of follow-up reporting in addition to perioperative recording, a very different registry from some that you're familiar with, such as NISQIP. Outcome data is used for benchmarking that will lead to cost reduction, quality improvement, new practice guidelines, and device performance. You've seen this slide before, which demonstrates the exponential growth of the VQI. Uh, Jack alluded and, and nicely pointed out to the fact that at least 50% of the participating physicians are non-vascular surgeons. This demonstrates the uh, growth of regional quality groups across the United States. And again, you saw this slide previously, and if you look at Medicare published data, uh, for better or worse, vascular surgeons are the dominant providers of lower extremity interventions when you combine both open and endovascular procedures. You're going to next hear from two members of our society who have been responsible for two practice guidelines, one the Wi-Fi classification, which will be presented by Joe Mills, and next the management for asymptomatic disease and claudication presented by Mike Conti. Thanks for the opportunity to speak. Thank you very much. And I'll actually invite Dr. Michael Conti to uh, speak. He's a professor in chief of the Division of Vascular and Endovascular Surgery at the University of California, San Francisco. Thanks and good morning. <clears throat> I'm a practicing vascular surgeon and have uh, served as a chair of the Lower Extremity Guidelines Committee for SVS and also a recent chair of the AHA PVD Council. These are my disclosures. 
Uh, in 2015, the SVS published a practice guideline that addressed the issues of asymptomatic PAD and intermittent claudication, two of the key questions uh, today. To do this, we commissioned independent evidence-based reviews of the data and had a consensus guideline development process with a publication that came out this year in the Journal of Vascular Surgery. Related specifically to asymptomatic PAD, as already presented, this is a highly prevalent condition in the Medicare population due to standard prevalent risk factors. We know it portends a high risk for mortality in major cardiovascular events. To date, the evidence does not really strongly support broad evidence-based population screening and more research is needed in terms of the benefits of targeted screening. Basic interventions such as smoking cessation, patient education, and lifestyle modifications were felt to be grade one recommendations by our group. Unfortunately, the evidence supporting medical intervention specific to the asymptomatic population as presented earlier is somewhat weak. The current guidelines, for example, on statin use do not address asymptomatic patients or the use of the ABI. We need more research specific to interventions targeting this population as far as their disease progression. Very importantly, we strongly recommend against the use of invasive treatments for asymptomatic PAD regardless of hemodynamic measurements or imaging findings that demonstrate disease. This was felt to be a very strong recommendation. There may be some unique exceptions, including the treatment of popliteal aneurysms, which may not be considered here, repeat interventions to maintain bypass graft patency. And the benefit of repeat interventions to maintain endovascular interventions is really not well known, and more evidence and research is needed here. In terms of intermittent claudication, this is the most common symptom uh, related to peripheral artery disease in the Medicare population. It portends a higher risk of cardiovascular events and significant disability, but we know there's a very low risk of major amputation. Smoking cessation and risk factor modification in medical therapies are a standard of care. Specific to the limb, we'll talk pharmacotherapy and exercise therapy and revascularization do yield improvements uh, compared to, to, to standard of care. Medical therapies, as I mentioned, for atherosclerosis are standard of care, but specific to the treatment of the disability, uh, we did recommend with a relatively weak level of evidence the use of solostazol uh, and potentially the ACE inhibitor ramipril. Further studies are needed here, and the overall degree of benefit is relatively modest, as recently shown by earlier speakers. Importantly, supervised exercise does have very strong evidence to support its use in improving functional outcomes in claudication, and even home-based exercise now has growing evidence to support potential efficacy, and we recommend this as a first line of treatment for most patients. The limitations currently are lack of reimbursement, and also the data also lacks in terms of long-term sustainability of the intervention on patients. As far as revascularization, we understand and we recognize the limitations of the current data that are available. In current practice, revascularization for claudication must be a carefully considered individualized decision based on numerous factors such as the severity of disease and the anticipated risk versus benefit. Key factors that are predictable include comorbid conditions and the anatomic pattern of disease that we know determine the subsequent efficacy. Importantly, our groups decided that it was time to submit a minimal threshold of efficacy for this dis disabling disease, which is non-limb threatening. We believe that on average, patients should expect at least two years of clinical benefit for an invasive therapy for claudication, and that should be tailored to the anatomic circumstance where those expectations exist. And although the level of evidence to support this presently is low, clearly more research is needed to support this kind of, uh, uh, of evidence, and we need longer-term data than the regulatory studies currently afford us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Dr. Joseph Mills, uh, the Chief Division of Vascular and Endovascular Surgery, the Director of the Vascular Fellowship and Residency Programs, also Professor of Surgery in the Department of Surgery at the University of Arizona. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I've been involved in the SVS practice guidelines on lower extremity disease, diabetes, and internationally. I've since relocated to the Baylor College of Medicine. These are my disclosures. I think if I can emphasize one thing, the, the reason you're going to have to vote, you don't know the answer to these questions today, especially for critical limb ischemia, is that that term was developed over 40 years ago when our patients were different. They were smokers, the primary problem was ischemia, and they weren't diabetic. Uh, now we have this wide spectrum of disease, and if you look at these slides, these are patients I've treated over the last 30 years. They're all Rutherford category five, except possibly the one on the right. And you can see that the treatment for this is going to vary a lot. There's not going to be one answer. 
Uh, the reason things have changed is the global epidemic of diabetes, which is one of the non-communicable diseases. There's now almost 30 million diabetics in this country. There's almost 380 million diabetics in the world. And the most common reason a diabetic comes to the hospital is for a wound, possibly infected, which results in an amputation once every 17 seconds in the world. Diabetics are high cost. It's about 20% of the cost related to the foot from diabetic foot admissions. And each episode costs somewhere between forty dollars and $94,000 for inpatient diabetic foot admissions. So the reason we came up with this system is we think that the term CLI doesn't apply to most of our patients and that we needed a different classification system. And if we don't define the patients different up front, much like cancer with TNM, we'll never know what the outcomes are. So why do I say that? This is the original paper, over 40 years old, of definition of critical limb ischemia. It was a consensus one-page paper. And what everybody forgets is that diabetics were excluded from this. If you have diabetes, you also have neuropathy. You have a wide spectrum of wounds. There is no single cutoff that predicts healing. And they're often complicated by infection. If you have PAD plus infection, this is from the Eurodial study, it triples your amputation risk and yet infection's not even mentioned in Rutherford or Fontan. So we think ischemia is a spectrum, and how much revascularization, or even if revascularization is required, depends on other things than just ischemia. And so we came up with Wi-Fi, which briefly, I won't go through the whole thing here, but it's based on categorizing wound, ischemia, and foot infection from zero, none, to mild, moderate, and severe. And based on those classifications, you can place the patient into four categories of limb risk. And this turns out to be true now by four validated single center trials done in almost 1,800 patients that show that this does predict risk of amputation regardless of therapy, whether it's endovascular, open, or medical therapy. Now, to answer some of the specific questions you have to vote on, is revascularization for limb salvage effective? I think the answer is a qualified yes, based on historical controls such as the Circulase trial and large studies from Europe where untreated patients with severe limb ischemia had 15 to 34 percent amputation rates in 6 to 12 months without revascularization. Now an interesting thing that's been alluded to earlier is amputation is regional. There are certain hotbeds and if you look at this data from Goodney, the more in, uh, vascular attention that's given to the problem, the fewer amputations. So if there's more angiograms, endovascular therapy, and uh, bypasses, the amputation risk drops, so we recommend that referral to vascular specialists for such patients be encouraged. Secondly, lack of recognition of ischemia is a common problem, so we recommend that all patients with non-traumatic foot wounds, especially diabetics with or without infection, get blood flow measured. Uh, we think that we should encourage the development of teams. There are multiple studies that show teamwork which frequently consists of podiatry plus a vascular specialist, reduce amputations, and to that end, vascular, the SVS and the APMA combined to develop a, a, a collaborative effort. We recommend that this be encouraged. Uh, there is only one trial for this problem, despite how common it is, and it did show if patients live longer than two years, they had longer mortal lower mortality and better limb salvage if they had bypass first. Our final Dr. Recommend Mills, you're out of time, so if you okay. want to just wrap up. Our final recommendation is these studies be encouraged because we don't have any data. And finally, I have some slides for disparity, which you can view on your own. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Oscar Alvarez, who's the director, Center for Curative and Palliative Wound Care at the Calvary Hospital in the Bronx. Good morning. Calvary Hospital is the only acute care hospital totally dedicated to the management of palliative care patients. Uh, in this morning's presentation, I'd like to give you our humble attempt in a clinical trial looking at high-pressure intermittent pneumatic compression for the treatment and palliation of patients without an operative option. My disclosure is I am a Yankee fan, being here in Oriole country, and no, none others other than the funding for the study, which I'll mention later. There are several H HP IPC devices available, and they vary tremendously in cost. Compression has been used to treat PAD and CLI since 1917, and there's quite a bit of evidence, uh, albeit not always graded to the standards of today's standards, but quite a bit of evidence, in fact, uh, exists. Uh, there are also systematic reviews uh, that are available also. Um, 
in our study, we screened 64 patients, we randomized 34, and it took us uh, f almost five years to actually do this trial. So this gives you an idea how difficult they are to do. And there were 18 in the treatment group and eight, 16 in the exercise group, which was not supervised. And the major evaluations involved different wound healing, uh, pain, and mostly patient reported outcomes. Here's an example of the pump. As Dr. Van Bemmelen pointed later, before um, uh, this talk, uh, they are a rapid high pressure compression provided at intermittent uh, times. We used uh, the Baker Wong face scale and the VET scale for evaluating pain, and we used a short form 36 to evaluate quality of life, both physical component and mental component. The statistics are here. The mean peak walking times for HPIC and control in, were both increased, a little greater for the HPIPC, especially at the 16-week time point. It took 16 weeks, but if you look at the mean change from baseline and peak walking time, uh, at 4, 8, and 16 weeks, the 16-week group showed statistical significance. The ABIs did not significantly change. However, the temperature change between the foot and chest um, uh, ratio did increase, uh, showing a sign for, for vascularization. The perceived improvement uh, from, at, uh, from the health qual uh, survey questionnaire showed here that there were statistical significances in both the physical function and bodily pain, comparing both the HPIPC group and the exercise control. The percent reduction in wound care, only 20% only completely healed, which is seven out of the 43, out of the 34, but in fact, they all improved. Here's an example of improvement, but not healing. You can manage a wound like the panel on the right very easily. These are not difficult wounds when they start to heal. Leg pain at baseline and after treatment was statistically significant when you use the Baker Wong scale uh, in favor of the HPIPC. Uh, and the mechanism of action was also elucidated earlier on. So I acknowledge uh, uh, the New York, uh, New York Department of Health for funding the study at $25,000 a year for four years. The arterial pneumatic compression devices were provided at no cost from biocompression, and the Bronx YMCA provided free temporary membership for our patients to do the exercising. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Alvarez. Uh, I'd like to introduce Gary Ansel, who's the executive board member of Viva Physicians. Thank you very much. I appreciate the ability to uh, participate today. Uh, my, whoops, where's my slide? There we go. Security alert is on my screen. What? Uh, no, uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, we also can't hear you, despite the fact that you're unsecure. Okay. All right. Just as long as I don't get strip searched, I'm good. <laughs> Probably for all of us. So I'm glad to present to, you <laughs> to the MedCAC panel. Don't take that time from uh, my travel logic was supported by a not-for-profit Viva Physician Group, which is a multi-specialty group based on research and education for vascular disease. These are my financial statements. I'm the system medical chief for vascular at a large uh, healthcare system that's a multi-leveled hospital, multiple different specialties, and primarily a non-RVU quality-based performance model for re reimbursement. I'll be addressing the critical limb uh, questions. The take-home points and things that I left a nice big slide set for you to review, but I'm not going to reiterate all the things you've heard about the prevalence of peripheral arterial disease, how this is a brittle population, how they have a very poor early and late prognosis. I really want to get to the fact that this is a diabetic population that's expanding. You've already heard that this leaves out a number of the patients from the Rutherford class. And as you'll see, what I want you to point, point out is that these are infrapopatial lesions, usually long total occlusions. But even that is not what it's really about. And even the best trial doesn't take into account the fact that many of these patients do not have patent plantar arches. The reason that's important is if you don't provide perfusion to the area that is not getting blood flow, the chance of healing goes down. This should not not be an endo versus surgery uh, requirement. This is actually customizing the care for the patient to make sure that we get the best chance for healing. Angioso model, which is perfusing the area that has limb ischemia or wound, is the, angio is the model that we be should be using to make sure we're supplying the blood that needs to be there for heal. As you can see, if you don't do that, your chances of healing go dramatically down, and this is the diabetic population. This is just a picture of a bunch of the patients that have diabetes that don't have intact plantar arches and why we have to be very aggressive. 
whether it's a heel ulcer or a toe ulcer, is very different on how we should be approaching these patients. I'm going to give you an example of that. This patient has pretty good flow to the anterior tibial artery, but it really needs reconstruction in the foot to be able to get flow to that heel ulcer and the toe ulcer. With advanced therapies, that's only available at several hospitals in the United States and around the world, but pioneered in Italy. You can see that with this new technology, we've been able to get through these total occlusions and really supply this with long balloon angioplasty and come up with reperfusion for these limbs where the area is being destructed. This is not just diabetics, but is also in the dialysis patient population. And in summary, I want you to know that there's not just one uh, technology that's best. Even in endovascular, you're going to see that this patient population needs to be treated when they're ambulatory. We want to make sure that they get the best device for that wound. And that may be different for the lesion, it may be surgery, but we have to customize this to the patient. Yes, there's data. If you look at Italy that has the lowest amputation rate in the, in the world, you can see that almost 1,000 patients with a five-year repeat intervention rate of 12.7%, very high limb salvage. Whether it be eczema or laser or more the, the more recent balloon angioplasty, very low one-year retreatment rates with very high limb salvage rates. You've already heard and you will hear about the basal trial. And again, we're seeing longer term data for both surgery and endovascular. It's about customizing for the patient. So with that, I'll go to my final slide just to summarize and keep us on time. But I've given you a slide set that you can uh, go through to get all the different trials. One of the things is, is that as we've seen endovascular increase and vascular surgery decrease, we have seen a lowering of the amputation rate, and that's important. And I'll get to the take-home messages. Modern management of CLI is a balance between arterial conduit and limb preservation and a patient's functional outcomes. Technology and techniques will continue to evolve and allow us to improve on current treatment options, both endovascular and surgery. Future trial data sets will hopefully help define the best treatment guidelines for specific patient populations, not an us versus them mentality. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'd now like to introduce uh, Dr. Kenneth Rosenfield, uh, who's the president-elect for the Society for Cardiovascular Angiography and Interventions. Does it come up? Thank you. Sorry. Is that... Uh, oh, thank you. So my name is Ken Rosenfield. I'm president-elect, as you said, of the uh, Society for Cardiac Angiography and Intervention, or SKY. I'm an interventional cardiologist and vascular medicine physician and a section head for vascular medicine at Mass General Hospital. I co-founded the NCDR Carotid and Peripheral Vascular Intervention Registries and have led many PAD trials with Dr. Menard, who spoke earlier, and Dr. Farber on the co-PI of the BEST CLI trial, which emphasizes, again, the multidisciplinary team approach to CLI. And I was the PI of the Levant II drug-coated balloon trial, which was recently reported in the New England Journal. Uh, which sets a really a new standard for rigor in PAD device trials. Uh, these are my, con my potential conflicts. Um, for today's panel meeting, I have the, uh, as president uh, elect of SKY, I have the special privilege to introduce a coalition of seven professional organizations that came together to advocate for patients by providing a cohesive series of presentations which will follow to address the MedCAC questions. This unique coalition includes the ACC, um, American College of Radiology, American Heart Association, SKY, Society for Interventional Radiology, Society for Vascular Medicine, and Viva Physicians. Collectively, this multidisciplinary group represents nearly 150,000 members dedicated to high-quality, value-driven, patient-centric vascular care. Feel free to review my slides, which provide a, a general backdrop for PAD, but I will not go into them in detail here. Um, <clears throat> What I will say is the next eight, eight speakers will speak to these issues, and they are members of this coalition, and they include Dr. Beckman, who's going to talk about underdiagnosis and undertreatment of, of patients with PAD, Drs. Uh, Jerry Bartholomew and Rob Lickstein talking about asymptomatic patients with PAD, Drs. Jaff and Arano addressing intermittent claudication, Dr. Shishabor, who will address critical limb ischemia, and Dr. Misra, who will talk about evidence gaps in treatment uh, decision making and the final uh, talk will be by Dr. J Jim Freilich who talked about PA dis treatment disparities. The essence of what this group believes is as follows. We are all passionate about improving the lives of our patients, their longevity, their quality of life, their ability to walk, to function and preserve limbs. 
and we believe that current treatments are already making a difference for our patients with PAD, as you've heard today. But we can do even better. Treatment can be redefined and improved. And we sh there are four particular shared tenets that, we, that tie us together. The first is that peripheral arterial disease is a complex one. Treating it requires an interdisciplinary team approach in order to provide optimal care and achieve the best outcomes for all patients. Secondly, the foundation for the care of patients with PAD from undiagnosed to asymptomatic to typical and atypically symptomatic to CLI rests on provider expertise and quality of care. And since quality of care is paramount to ensuring good outcomes, it must be measured. Thirdly, we all acknowledge that there are huge, large treatment gaps in our evidence base and we are committed to closing them as a team. Rapid advances and increasing therapeutic alternatives, particularly less invasive endovascular options, have created a moving target. An additional challenge is establishing what really truly constitutes a meaningful outcome for patients. Registries can be effective, as you heard, in adding to the evidence base, and they should also be used to track outcomes and to improve the quality of care. To be effective in this space, though, registries must allow for universal participation and not be restrictive. CMS should partner with all of the organizations speaking at today's MedCAC panel meeting to determine necessary and sufficient elements to be included in a registry. And finally, choice is important to our patients. Medicare beneficiaries should be entitled to have access to therapies that offer the prospect to improve quality of life, ability to walk, and maintain independence. Recommendations coming out of this important panel meeting should preserve the ability for patients to make individualized choices based on open discussion of benefits and risks with their team of providers. So on behalf of this multidisciplinary collaboration, and the efforts we, and the patients we serve, we greatly appreciate the opportunity to speak on these important issues. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Rosenfield. I, I'd now like to introduce Dr. Josh Beckman from UO, who's speaking on behalf of the American Heart Association. Uh, good morning, and thank you very much for having me. Are my slides up? My name is Josh Beckman. I'm the current chair of the PVD Council for the American Heart Association. Here are my disclosures. Uh, neither the AHA nor I receive funding to participate in today's meeting. The AHA uh, is an organization of more than 22 million volunteers dedicated to reducing cardiovascular morbidity and mortality through scientific-based rem scientific remedies. Today we're going to be discussing patients with PAD. This meeting is basically focused on what happens after we diagnose them. We need to, f we need to consider how patients with PAD are first identified especially in the asymptomatic and atypically symptomatic patients. And the problem is there's a dramatic underdiagnosis. Under we know who has PAD. In the fourth line down, you can see a screening study of people over the age of 65. One in five men and one in six women has PAD. This is a huge population for CMS. We know that most people are not recognized. Rena Pandey published using the NHANES database. You can see here of the 7,500 patients over the age of 40, 647 of them had PAD. Only 196 were diagnosed with recognized PAD, whereas 451 weren't. This corresponds to nearly 5 million Americans who have undiagnosed PAD. 5 million Americans. We know that this is a problem because from the same paper, when you're not treated appropriately, you die more quickly. Notice here that the patients who received two or more preventive therapies of aspirin, an ACE inhibitor, and a statin had a 65% reduction in mortality, whereas everybody else basically died like smelts. PAD is treated less well than, than atherosclerosis in other vascular beds. PAD is the disparity. There are millions of patients who are underdiagnosed or untreated. Inadequate treatments increase mortality, and recently approved medications may reduce the need for revascularization. The ABI needs to be covered by CMS because it is a diagnostic test and meets the CMS definition for diagnostic test. A diagnostic test from the Medicare Benefits Policy Manual is the, a test that aids in the assessment of a medical condition or the identification of a disease, uh, and it is also given to determine the nature and severity. That is the ABI. It is not a screening test. That is a historical accident. CMS defines a preventive service as one that can prevent you from getting the disease or diagnose it really early on. By the time you have peripheral artery disease, you have a tremendous amount of atherosclerosis and a highly increased risk of death and cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. 
We strongly recommend that all patients in the Medicare population should have at least a one-time screening ankle brachial index covered by CMS. We know that the patients, one out of five men, one out of six women, has PAD in the Medicare population. We're no, we know we're missing five million people with the disease. We know we can make their lives better and longer. We also know that PAD is undertreated. Once diagnosed, patients do not get the same level of treatment as atherosclerosis and other vascular beds. They do not get access to supervised rehabilitation like all other atherosclerotic patients do. You can see that they feel just as bad as patients with, with stage three New York Heart Association heart failure. And we know that when you put them on an exercise treadmill and you supervise them, they walk longer. This is the CLEVER trial. Here's, a co here's 21 consecutive trials. You heard the technical panel, supervised exercise works. We strongly recommend that all patients in the Medicare population with claudication be offered exercise rehab like patients after PCI, cabbage, or heart valve surgery. What does coverage mean? These services should be covered because CMS has a vested interest in diagnosing atherosclerosis. The ABI is as reasonable as an ETT, an EKG, or a carotid ultrasound. We want to reduce mortality from atherosclerosis, and we want to improve functional capacity, just as we do after MI, cabbage, or patients with stable angina. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Beckman. I'd now like to introduce Dr. John Bartholomew, who who is the uh, president-elect of the Society of Vascular Medicine. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, this is my disclosure slide. Um, I am uh, president-elect of the Society of Vascular Medicine. We are over 500 members. We have been uh, in, in running for over 26 years running. Um, one in every 20 Americans has PAD, and PAD raises your risk for heart attack and stroke. It is common, it is underdiagnosed, it causes significant morbidity, poor quality of life, and it overlaps, as you well know, with coronary and cerebral vascular disease. And as you've heard over and over today, it is a predictor of adverse prognosis. PAD is common, but your patient may have never heard of it. This was an awareness uh, uh, gaps in public knowledge study that looked at the awareness of PAD, and it compared to other, stud um, other diseases such as multiple sclerosis, Lou Gehrig's disease, cystic fibrosis. And as you see here, the prevalence of PAD is over 9, mil uh, 9 million individuals compared to multiple sclerosis where 300,000. But the disease awareness was only 26%. In other words, 76% of individuals did not know about PAD. This is an older study, uh, almost 20 years ago, but looking at patients with PAD, and it noted that they were less intensely treated than patients with coronary artery disease. In fact, PAD patients were less likely to recall a physician's advice to exercise so important for their claudication. PAD patients were significantly less likely to take cholesterol medications or be offered or advised to follow a low cholesterol diet. In addition, they were less likely to take aspirin. And you've already heard the Nahane study. Uh, it, this is a study that uh, is called the National Health and Nutrition Examination Study. And it looked at PAD patients and it found that statin use was reported in only 31% of the individuals, ACE or ARB in, only, uh, in a, approximately 25%, and aspirin in 36%. Uh, and as you've heard, it, this corresponds to over 5 million people not taking a statin, 5.4 not taking an ACE or an ARB, and 4.5 not taking aspirin. This is the reduction of atherothrombosis for continued health, a REACH registry, and this looked at two-year rates of vascular-related hospitalization and associated costs in patients at risk of atherothrombosis. And what it found was that there was a higher rate of polyvascular disease for patients with PAD more than with CAD or uh, cerebral vascular disease. There was a greater degree of undertreatment of atherosclerosis risk factors in patients with PAD compared to coronary and cerebral vascular disease, and it revealed higher cardiovascular event rates for patients with PAD compared to CAD and CVD. In addition, it suggested that stable patients with asymptomatic PAD have high annual costs, largely because of the high rates of cardiovascular events and hospitalizations, and costs escalate in time as the PAD becomes more symptomatic. PAD is a morbid disease. It's a major risk factor for lower extremity amputation. Quality of life impairment is more severe than 
heart failure or MI. There's functional impairment is common even among patients with atypical leg symptoms. There's a decreased walking uh, distance, a decreased walking velocity, and there's also objective evidence of depression that is twice as common among patients with PAD. Millions of U.S. adults with PAD are not receiving secondary prevention therapies. These therapies, as you've heard over and over again, may reduce the risk of adverse cardiovascular events. Treatment with multiple therapies is associated with reduced all-cause mortality. So the take-home message, PAD is common, underdiagnosed, and undertreated. Most patients do not have classic symptoms. PAD is a coronary risk equivalent, and aggressive risk factor modification can save lives. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Bartholomew. I, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Robert Luckstein from the Society of Interventional Radiology. Good morning. Thank you to the panel for having the opportunity to speak. Uh, I'm representing the Society of Interventional Radiology. I'm a practicing interventional radiologist in uh, New York City, and I serve as the uh, chair for the Peripheral Arterial Disease Working Group for the Society of Interventional uh, Radiology. I have several uh, comments I'd like to make uh, within the theme of the coalition, as Dr. Rosenfield previously in introduced. These are my disclosures. When you look at evidence for the, for the treatment of asymptomatic lower extremity peripheral arterial disease, there are three consensus documents that have been written in the last decade. The first is uh, first authored by Dr. Hirsch, who sits on the panel today. This represents the ACC, the AHA, the SIR, the SVM, numerous other subspecialty uh, organizations uh, convening to provide recommendations for the care of asymptomatic patients. The second is the TAS-2 document, again, multiple specialties, including the uh, North American Society of Vascular Surgery and the European Society of Vascular Surgery combining to provide recommendations for the treatment of asymptomatic patients. And then most recently, the document that Dr. Conti referenced in his previous presentation. This slide references the natural history of the asymptomatic patient, where we all believe as a unified multi-specialty consensus that the major intervention in the asymptomatic cohort is to, review, is to reduce the cardiovascular morbidity and the mortality associated with this disease. We do not recommend revascularization as a primary therapy in the treatment of the asymptomatic population. As previously mentioned, lifestyle modification, including smoking cessation, patient education regarding the diagnosis, blood pressure and lipid control are the primary benefits to reduce the all-cause cardiovascular events associated with this diagnosis. And again, just to be clear, none of us in the specialties recommend revascularization in the asymptomatic population. With reference to critical limb ischemia, and my colleague Dr. Sheshabor will reference this uh, further, uh, we are asked to uh, determine whether or not there's sufficient evidence for an intervention to improve the life of patients with critical limb ischemia. And I would reference the article recently published by Dr. Hurst, who again sits on this panel, the REACH study, who prospectively looked at almost 8,000 patients across the world referencing them uh, as patients who had undergone an ischemic lower extremity amputation against those with PAD who did not. This study demonstrated a significant increase, almost 100% increase in the incidence of myocardial infarction, stroke, and all-cause cardiovascular death from patients who had undergone a lower extremity amputation. The evidence suggests that if we can avoid an amputation, we will reduce these risks. This risk was further confounded from patients having a more recent amputation as compared to patients having a remote amputation. Again, I will reference the uh, AHA guideline documents. I have the privilege of sitting on the more recent uh, guideline document, which is currently in, uh, in draft form for the AHA and ACC, SVS and SIR, uh, SVM are represented in this document uh, as, as well. And specifically, the recommendations on the most recent published documents for critical limb ischemia from the TAS-2 document is that revascularization is the optimal treatment for patients with critical limb ischemia. And according to the ACC and AHA guidelines, the treatment of critical limb ischemia is dependent on increasing blood flow to the affected extremity to relieve the ischemic pain, heal the ischemic ulcerations, and avoid limb loss. 
As Dr. Jones referenced this article, the uh, AHRQ review, which specifically addressed the comparative effectiveness between endovascular therapy and surgical revascularization for patients with critical limb ischemia. And as of 2015, we believe that endovascular therapy is at least as effective as surgical revascularization in the treatment of critical limb ischemia with the goals of avoiding major amputation in the affected limb. The uh, coalition previously referenced endorses the BEST CLI trial. SIR is participating actively in the BEST CLI trial, which will further define the exact role of endovascular therapy for specific critical limb ischemia cohorts. Uh, thank please you try for your attention. Oh, great. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to introduce Dr. Michael Jaff, who's the president of Viva Physicians. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a privilege to be here to represent uh, this group of physicians who are interested solely in the diagnosis and management of patients with peripheral vascular diseases. My uh, disclosures have been provided prior to my presentation this morning. Uh, I will note that my presence here was funded by Viva Physicians for all travel-related expenses. Uh, as Dr. Ansel mentioned, Viva Physicians is a 501c3 not-for-profit education and research consortium solely focused on peripheral vascular diseases. I am the president. All officers and board members receive a stipend for their service to the organization based on documentation of specific hours worked. I would also like to disclose that I am the founder and medical director of VASCOR, the Vascular Ultrasound Core Laboratory, which has participated in over 170 clinical trials in 66 countries. Many of the PAD trials referenced this morning and throughout the day uh, we participated in. VASCOR is solely owned by the Massachusetts General Physicians Organization. All agreements are provided between the sponsor and the MGPO, not me and my salary is not tied in any way to the number of trials or performance of VASCOR. I'm going to be speaking specifically about intermittent claudication as the question uh, at hand from the panel. And you've already heard all of the information that I was going to discuss about longevity, the limitations of patients with intermittent claudication. There is much more to this than just blockage of a pipe, but lots of cellular mechanistic problems that exist in PAD. You've already heard about the tremendous coexistent comorbidities of coronary disease, cerebrovascular disease, and all cause-related mortality. We understand the risk factors, including diabetes, which is not only the Medicare population, but around the world as well. The question about sufficient evidence about uh, uh, interventions that improve the immediate near-term and long-term outcome is true. It's absolutely true if we're talking about improvement in functional ability. You've already seen all of the information about exercise. We wholeheartedly support coverage of exercise therapy as a principal and primary treatment for patients with intermittent claudication. In addition, we feel it's critically important that all full medical therapy be offered as first-line treatment. You've already seen an excellent presentation by my colleagues from Duke about this technology assessment, and you heard from Dr. Dake about some of the information about a drug-eluting stent. There were a number of studies that were not included in that initial uh, presentation, and although reviewed uh, today by Drs. Uh, Schuyler Jones and Manesh Patel, there's lots of information there worth this panel understanding, and you can review that in the slides. What I would like to call your attention to is this. We now actually do have data demonstrating functional improvement in patients who are treated with an endovascular intervention. This is 12-month data from the IMPACT SFA trial published in December in circulation demonstrating that although the six-minute walk time did not change between the drug-eluting balloon and the bare balloon, there was a dramatic 88% reduction in fewer interventions in those patients who had the drug-eluting balloon, suggesting that uh, risk to patients for complications and cost are clearly to the advantage. And this is the first this has been shown. We've also already heard about the CLEVER trial. The IRONIC trial, a similar study looking at quality of life, demonstrated in patients with claudication that if they received an endovascular intervention, they had an improvement not only in physical functioning, but in quality of life. 
Finally, I would like to remind you that one of the great uh, parts about being in the field of vascular medicine and taking care of these patients is the dramatic advance in technology and the quality of the literature that has been generated over the past several years with great anticipation for improved outcomes and data in the future. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Jaff. Uh, now I'd like to introduce Dr. Herb Aronow, uh, who's the chair of the American Card College of Cardiology. I'd like to thank the panel for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, I want to clarify, I'm actually not the chair of the ACC, but of its Peripheral Vascular Disease Council and section. My apologies. None, uh, none taken. It would be quite an honor to be the chair of the ACC. So. My, uh, Potential conflicts are shown here. They're largely societal and not financial. The American College of Cardiology did uh, support me in travel expenses for today. The ACC is a, a nearly 50,000 member organization, a not-for-profit, uh, and uh, its members are responsible for caring for patients with cardiovascular and as it relates to today's presentation, uh, patients with lower extremity PAD. My task is a little easier than those who came before and who will come after me today, and then I, I'm here to ask questions rather than answer them. Uh, and I'm going to specifically address a few gaps uh, as it relates to the patient with intermittent claudication, uh, long-term outcomes gaps, and uh, some subgroups and the gaps associated with them. I think uh, before I launch into that, I would just reiterate uh, points made earlier today in that the research paths we pursue whenever possible should be multidisciplinary and should, wherever possible, include the wealth of registry data we have available to us through our quality improvement initiatives at the ACC NCDR and the SVS VQI. With regard to long-term outcomes, uh, there is a lot we don't know. We really don't know what the relative effects are of contemporary medical therapy versus revascularization on late functional status and quality of life. We really don't understand the relative patency of most contemporary endovascular therapies beyond two years. We know little about the cost effectiveness of revascularization plus medical therapy. And when I say medical therapy, I include in that both medication and lifestyle interventions such as supervised exercise versus medical therapy alone. We don't know whether if there were coverage for supervised exercise therapy, what would happen with endovascular and open surgical revascularization rates. They might very well plummet. We also don't know what the rates of repeat revascularization would be after initial revascularization procedures were there coverage for supervised exercise therapy. And finally, we don't know what the potential impact would be by improving functional status and quality of life on subsequent cardiovascular morbidity and mortality in this patient cohort who has such a high risk of atherothrombotic events. As I mentioned, there are a number of subgroups in whom we must learn much more, the elderly, women and minorities to name a few, the elderly, as you know, have a very high prevalence of lower extremity PAD, but their ability to report, to self-report, uh, their limitation is limited. Many of them are unable to perform treadmill testing to diagnose or quantify their limitation. Uh, their procedural success is lower, their complication rates higher, and it's a very costly demographic to treat. We must learn more. In women who have a similar prevalence of PAD to men, they're often older and present with a greater comorbidity burden. They less often have classic symptoms and are often more uh, limited when they present with typical symptoms. Their outcomes after certain revascularization procedures may be worse than after others. We need to know more in this subgroup as well. And finally, in minorities, African Americans have a higher PAD prevalence than non-Hispanic whites and Hispanics. African Americans and Hispanics are more likely than whites to present with CLI than claudication, and they have outcomes that are worse after both endovascular and open surgical procedures. We must learn more in this subgroup as well. I'll end there. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Mehdi Shishabor, uh, the Director of Endovascular Services and Staff Interventional Cardiology and Vascular Medicine at the Cleveland Clinic. Thank you very much. Uh, I have uh, no conflict of Thank you very much. I have no conflict of interest to report. Um, and my travel was uh, supported by my institution. 
uh, and I'm grateful and honored to be here today to represent the seven societies and organizations, but more importantly, my patients with critical limb ischemia that I see in my clinic and I take care of in the hospital. As uh, discussed, I will be uh, discussing the interventions related to critical limb ischemia, which is the end stage of this uh, condition, those with rest pain, tissue loss, and gangrene. And let there be no doubt, as uh, presented today, that all guidelines have recommended a class one indication for revascularization for patients with critical limb ischemia. That means the revascularization is the cornerstone of therapy for patients with this specific condition with ulcers, tissue loss, and gangrene. And that has been supported by every guideline that has been published to date, including the ACCAHA guidelines. Unfortunately, if you look at the data, you see that the significant portion of the patients with critical limb ischemia are not getting this treatment. On the x-axis is the regional intensity of vascular care across the United States in patients that have Medicare. On the y-axis, the authors asked a very simple question. What's the proportion of patients that undergo amputation and get a vascular workup in the year prior to their amputation? And as you can see, depending on the intensity of the region, between 40 to 70 percent of the patients that get an amputation have no type of vascular workup or intervention prior to their amputation. As alluded earlier, there's a direct correlation. Very few things in medicine have a correlation of 0.87 between revascularization and amputation-free survival. Again, shown here on the x-axis is the intensity of, of revascularization rates, meaning more revascularization, the rates of amputation were lower in those, that had, in those uh, regions that had higher rates of revascularization. And again, the basal trial was mentioned earlier. The question of which approach is better, is it open or is it endo? And I think Dr. Ansel said it beautifully. This is not about open or endo. This is about a personalized approach, an individualized approach to the patient. A particular patient may benefit better from endovascular, while another may benefit better from open, and one may benefit from a hybrid approach. So the bottom line is that the revascularization is a treatment that we need to offer to these patients and individualize it to the particular patient that we are seeing in the clinic. This condition has significant morbidity and mortality. The patients that have CLI have significant pain. They have significant burden from a psychosocial uh, standpoint. And obviously they have a significant decline in their functional ability. And we know that ulcers are a prelude to amputation. That's the time that we have to intervene and prevent amputation in these patients, given the morbidity and mortality associated with amputation. There, this slide was shown earlier. There's a significant variation. Despite all the work and despite all the recommendations from the guidelines that revascularization is the cornerstone of therapy for these patients, there remains to be significant variation in the amputation in the country. But it's not just variation. It's a variation that's linked to race. It's a variation that links to the socioeconomic status. This is rates of amputation across various races depending on intensity of revascularization. Again, showing that blacks have significantly more amputation rates than whites. And again, shown here in another form, when you linked with socioeconomic status, showing that those that are African American and are from lower socioeconomic status almost have a three times higher rates of amputation. These are the things that, are, I, that I think we need to put our attention to uh, and try to uh, dilute these disparities. At the end, I'd like to emphasize that patients with critical limb ischemia are complex. They require a multidisciplinary approach that encompasses vascular specialists, internists, family physicians, wound experts, podiatrists, and folks that are committed to the care of these patients in order to decrease their morbidity and mortality from this condition. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Uh, Sanjay Misra, the, who's a professor of radiology at the Mayo Clinic. So uh, thank you very much to the panel for allowing us to speak. I'd like to uh, state that I'm representing the Society of Interventional Radiology. I'm a, at the Mayo Clinic, and the views that I'm presenting do not uh, represent the Mayo Clinic. The society has uh, reimbursed my uh, flight here, but I have not reimbursed anything else. So over the last uh, 15 years of my career, I've uh, had the opportunity to work on several writing panels. I've worked on American Heart consensus panels and several American 
consensus ACC AUC uh, panels. These are my disclosures. I think before we start in the questions, I think it's very important to understand we're here talking about patient care. And I'm going to uh, quote uh, Dr. Uh, Mayo, who once said that the best interest of the patient is the only interest to be considered. And so when you think about taking care of patients with vascular disease, they're very heterogeneous. And you can spend a lot of time uh, and effort trying to define what the best goals are for each of the patients. And we've all discussed those as far as cardiovascular outcomes. But each patient is very different. And recently, President Obama uh, laid out his precision medicine. And what we really want to do is figure out for each patient when you see him what is best for him or her. And so what I'm going to try to talk about is, one, what is the role of endovascular treatment of SFA in patients with intermittent claudication? versus supervised exercise therapy, and then what is the role of endovascular SFA treatment in advanced chronic kidney disease. And so this is the ERACE trial, uh, which was published only in abstract and presentation form, and it was presented at American Heart a few years ago, and it dealt with intermittent claudication patients, and it was to compare the effectiveness of treatment versus SCT, uh, uh, plus SCT versus supervised exercise therapy for intermittent claudication. And this was the randomization scheme. And as you'll see, I'm going to show you the results. At 12 months, patients that were revascularized all walked faster. So this is one of the important things. Unfortunately, supervised exercise therapy is now reimbursed in the U.S., and we would advocate for uh, reimbursement for SCT. This is the uh, VASCU uh, QOL uh, scores, and these all improved as well. These are secondary interventions of patients that were treated with SCT versus endovascular therapy. And as you can see, uh, the uh, tre secondary treatments uh, uh, were increased in patients that only underwent supervised exercise therapy. What about uh, advanced chronic kidney disease? I'm going to show you some uh, single center data of our own in 440 patients that underwent PTA or stent placement. Uh, these are the procedural details, and what I want to show you is this is, the this is the mortality for different stages of chronic kidney disease. We spoke earlier about not having outcomes based on all-cause mortality, and so if you were to stage patients into mild, moderate, and severe chronic kidney disease, you would see that there are different outcomes for all-cause mortality, and this is our own data set from the Mayo Clinic Rochester. What about amputation-free survival? This is the amputation-free survival curves, uh, Kaplan-Meier estimates, for the same uh, data set. So just based on different GFRs, there are different outcomes, even for endovascular treatment. This needs to be further defined and further investigated with studies. So this is, in part, why we have a variation in uh, lower extremity uh, procedures for CLI. And I'll show you the Minnesota map. This is uh, from Alan Hirsch. And as you can see, uh, Rochester and Minneapolis are outlined on the left. And we're in the southeast corner. And there are different outcomes for lower extremity amputation in the state of Minnesota, mortality, and stroke mortality. So what are the gaps? We've heard from uh, the SVC, SVS surgeons uh, about uh, the utility of bypass grafting. Unfortunately, in the endovascular world, we don't know what is the best treatment for the different patients. We don't know when, when is best for use angioplasty alone or the different technologies. We don't know what the clinical outcomes are. We've heard this from uh, Manesh and Schuyler Jones. Uh, we don't know what the functional outcomes are. We need to understand this better. What is the differences in the mortality, the all-cause mortality, non-fatal MIs, and stroke in intermittent claudication patients? Uh, Finally, please try and wrap up. Thank you. Finally, we need to understand what are, where are the individual roles for each of these technologies. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'd now like to introduce Dr. James Froelich, uh, President of the Society for Vascular Medicine. I'll ask again for people to please stay on time. Am I over time yet? <laughs> um, I'd like to thank uh, CMS for the opportunity to present here. I've been asked to talk about disparities and also to wrap up for the 10 previous speakers uh, who are part of this uh, unique consortium. Um, I'm currently Professor of Internal Medicine at the University of Michigan and uh, Director of Vascular Medicine and Assistant Chair of Medicine for Quality and Innovation. These are my disclosures. I've consulted for all the companies that make anticoagulants. 
Um, my travel and participation here today was, per, was supported by the Regents of the University of Michigan. The University of Michigan is a nonprofit educational organization that, is in, that produces and sells the finest higher education opportunity in the country and the finest football team. <laughs> I have data to support that and I'll meet with anybody in the outside afterwards, but I want to point out that I think it's CMS policy that fisticuffs on campus are prohibited. Um, so um, disparities, I want to say two things about disparities. First is, uh, there are clear racial and socioeconomic disparities in terms of access to care and outcomes when it comes to PAD. This was alluded to and covered by uh, Mehdi Shishimor. I want to look at some different data, some registry data to support this. These are amputation rates uh, among black and non-black populations. You can see the disparity is astronomical. Um, and this is true for every age group. When you look at Dartmouth Atlas data, you see that not only are there racial disparities in terms of amputation rates, but this varies also highly around the country. Um, and excluded from my final slide set was another similar map that looks at uh, revascularization rate by race prior to amputation. And as already been covered by Dr. Mills and Dr. Shishabor, uh, clearly there's a lower incidence of amputation when a uh, treatment strategy of revascularization has been tried. We're also, there's a lot of evidence suggesting socioeconomic status also has a huge impact on the likelihood of receiving uh, revascularization and amputation rate. These are data from UCLA using California uh, state uh, reimbursement data to show the marked disparity in terms of amputation rate based on income. These are uh, zip codes. And this just shows how it varies widely throughout the Los Angeles area. And these uh, graphical representation of these data show that there's a direct relationship between uh, socioeconomic status and the likelihood of suffering an amputation, as well as having access to uh, revascularization prior. And you can see the statistical outliers of uh, Compton and East Los Angeles where socioeconomic status is low and access to health care is low. So the second thing I wanted to say about disparities is PAD is a disparity. You heard Dr. Beckman allude to this earlier. And what we mean by this is patients with PAD are not receiving state-of-the-art health care, either medically or interventionally, uh, we believe. These are data that we produced from the GRACE Registry at the University of Massachusetts and uh, the University of Michigan that showed that patients um, uh, in the GRACE registry, which was a registry of acute coronary syndrome patients, you could see that those who had pre-existing PAD were grossly undertreated uh, compared with um, uh, those who did not have PAD. And this included things like smoking cessation counseling, the provision of aspirin and uh, lipid lowering medications as well as aspirin at discharge. Uh, the PVI registry is a statewide Michigan quality improvement consortium based on the uh, uh, partnership with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan, and it is a, an arrangement like Dr. Cronenwitt alluded to. Uh, practitioners are paid to participate in the registry, and we've learned that there, too, PAD patients are uh, poorly reimbursed. Please try and wrap up. And so I wanted to end by saying... Um, that I think this unique consortium of seven societies from multiple specialties brought together has raised four important points. One is PAD care is a team sport, and I think reimbursement should incentivize multidisciplinary programs. Evidence gaps exist. I support Dr. Cronenwitz's suggestion that CMS should incentivize registry participation. Potentially the cheapest and arguably most effective therapy for uh, PAD is not reimbursed by CMS, which I think is a potential huge cost savings. Uh, and I think the consortium gathered here is evidence of the fact that across all specialties, everyone believes that revascularization is an essential uh, part of the armamentarium for PAD. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Daphne Denham uh, from Comprehensive Wound Care. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I'm glad I'm at the end because rather than data, I've got some patient examples from my practice. I trained as a general surgeon about 20 years ago, started with Dr. Mills, 
And during the vascular rotations, I was always impressed with the patients that we couldn't help and we couldn't revascularize. And over the 20 years, as you all know, there have been many things that have changed that have allowed improvement of that. However, there are still patients that we can't help. I do not have any disclosures. And the patients that we have helped with the arterial pneumatic compression pumps are extremely grateful for the help. The first is a 97-year-old gentleman that I met with rest pain so badly that I didn't appreciate how mentally alert he was. He couldn't even sit still in the office, constantly shuffling his feet, trying to get comfortable. We've all seen patients like that. His wound was wet gangrene of his fifth toe. He quit smoking in 1937 and, as I said, was mentally alert. And this is a photo of his wet gangrene, and you can all appreciate the shininess. He's got some edema. He had a vascular bypass surgery years before. But by Wi-Fi criteria, his amputation risk is greater than 50%. His ABIs, they couldn't even detect a toe pressure on his great toe on the right, and about 30% flow severe critical limb ischemia. He declined further workup. He said, I'm 97, I don't need this. But he was grateful to have any opportunity to get rid of the pain. He started wearing the pneumatic arterial compression pumps and instead of three hours a day, he would sit in his chair and wear them eight hours a day because he had some comfort during the time that he wore them. Within six weeks, his rest pain was completely resolved and he was immensely grateful. His wound remained a dry, stable eschar, which fortunately we were able to hold off on everyone wanting to amputate him. And he died three months later in his sleep, but as I said, rest pain-free. The other was a 94-year-old. She's 95 now. I've known her several months. She presented with a simple blister. Her story, she was not a diabetic, also quit smoking in the 40s, but fairly mentally alert. Her wound demonstrates bone in the center of the wound. This is her Berger's test, impressive critical limb ischemia. Her ABI is not as impressive, but a toe pressure of 37, which is below the 55 needed to heal. Seven months later, she actually has completely healed the wound, which has surprised all of us because at times we got hospice involved. Her rest pain has resolved also. The next patient's 80 years old, had a previous amputation 10 years ago, and I'll slip through quickly. He presented with this ulcer, but he also had an arm sarcoma that he was getting worked up and had surgery, so he wanted no further workup. But because of his amputation, his PCP said, I, I want you to see someone before you progress on all the other. You can see his prosthetic in the other picture. After seven months, he healed this wound just using the pneumatic arterial compression pumps and local wound care. And I saw him back 11 months after we first initiated the pumps, and he actually came back to say, I just want to thank you. My feet are warm, all of his wounds were healed, and considering that he had a golden limb, he was extremely grateful for the opportunity to have improved perfusion of his remaining limb. This last patient, I was, was in my office the day that the slides were due. Like all of us, we put it off till late. But he has severe critical limb ischemia as well. And he was not deemed a candidate for intervention, neither interventional radiology or by surgery. And in just four weeks' time, he too, his pain was much improved, and he was grateful. Over the past five years that I've been doing exclusively wound care, I have seen at least over 100 patients. I think the numbers were up in the 130s, but I've moved around a little, so my data was not clean. I know we've had 20 deaths, but we've had two amputations out of the patients that we have added pumps to. Some of these have been interventional candidates, and we have added the pumps in conjunction with it but all others have healed or are healing and are grateful for the opportunity.